Hello everyone and welcome to the very first class of the Intense Crash Course in Objective C. With us tonight, we've got Mr. Nelson Lacay. Nelson. Jason. All right. We've got myself, Jason Busby. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And then, of course, sitting over here to the right of me is the lovely Miss Nina Covington. Nina's here to help out with keeping all of the questions kind of organized and making sure that nothing goes um, awry, nothing is missed. And also, Hi by guys. sitting here in the class, she's going to kind of get an idea of what all we're talking about, especially with this world of programming, because there's so much tech talk that's being thrown around over here all the time. <laughs> Risk and force. Hello. So the first thing I would like to point out, for those of you, and there's about 10 of you that are not over in BuzzNet at the moment, it's not an absolute requirement, but huh? I, I, I'm no longer requiring it. But it is huh. highly recommended. Um, as a matter of fact, this is going to be a very interactive course, and I would really appreciate those of you that can be in it to be in it because you're going to be submitting code to us during the class when we have you do little exercises, challenges, competitions with one another. There's all sorts of things that we've got planned over the next four weeks. Uh, and we will see how that works here in just a minute. So, um, so yeah, please make sure to get into BuzzNet to do that. All you need to do, you should be seeing my screen now, is open your browser and go to buzznet.3dbuzz.com. Enter your regular 3D Buzz credentials and you should be able to jump right in. Unless, of course, you're Bazacat. And then I have absolutely no idea why <laughs> he's guy. got the one browser in the entire world that does not, well, not just browser, browsers, since he's tried IE and Chrome, and he just cannot get data. So, Nelson, it wouldn't be a bad idea to follow up with him to see if we can figure out what weird anomaly could be causing this problem. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that the, there's, it's probably just a problem that will affect more than one person. So. Yeah. So a couple of things real quick that I want to point out. Number one, this is the most important thing to understand. Oh, my God, this is so important. This is a beginner class. This is a very important class because we're going to be moving into mobile platform development here very soon. So we've got courses coming up for Android, Windows Phone 8, and the iPhone. And on 3D Buzz, we have a ton of material that covers C Sharp. We've got C++. Um, we even have buried somewhere on there, I think, in some of the Unity stuff, uh, some JavaScript stuff. Basically, everything you need to get comfortable up and going to follow along with the Windows Phone 8 course and with the Android course is already available on 3D Buzz. Now, the, the uh, material to get yourself up to speed quickly so that you can follow along with an iPhone course is not currently available on 3D Buzz. And that is why we're doing this course here so that we can get those of you that are interested in being able to program in Xcode and Objective-C you know, up to speed quickly. So very important stuff. This is beginner material. Now over in your webinar panel, I'm going to make sure all hands are down. You have the ability to raise your hand. We did this last night, but I'd like, since now we've got a lot more people in here. Uh, Terry, put your hand back down. Nick? All right. <laughs> Those of you that are completely new to programming, raise your hand. Yeah, James, put your hand down. <laughs> all right. So, honestly, right now, your hand, Brian, your hand should only be up if you are completely new. Okay. Very good. So there, there are quite a few people in the class right now that are completely new to programming, which means that I do not want us to start traveling down a rabbit hole, jumping off on tangents, getting into anything complicated that will end up messing someone else up who is trying to get a grasp of what's going on. This is really important. There's a lot of feedback that's been given to us over the past uh, in regards to our live classes, and one of the things that frustrates people is when we get um, off the trail, so to speak. So we're going to stay focused. That is very important. Now, we will be offering open office hours, 
And in open, open office hours, we will provide times in which you guys can come in. We will record the entire session. And in times like those, that's, that's when you can ask pretty much anything you want. And yeah, there's, there's lots of leniency there. So, uh, so save anything that goes um, off or would cause us to go off on a tangent for open office hours. And that's right, no MLP stuff. No MMO stuff. We need to stay focused. You got that, Nelson? Mm. Mm. Okay, so <laughs> two of the requirements for this class one is, uh, well, I'm sorry, let me back up. It's not a requirement, but I would really like for you guys to use it, and that is with BuzzNet. We have made a change to BuzzNet, and you can see right now that there is a send code button up in the top. What I would like to do real quick is to actually test this out. So... Um, what I can do is come over here to view code, and I can say allow submissions, and I'm going to give a, um, let's call this, uh, say, hello, everyone. And I can, as soon as I send that out, everybody should get the ability to submit code. And what I want you to do right now is just go in there and say hi, and maybe, maybe say where you're from, you know, what, what country. Because I am interested. Look at that. MMO Dust was number one. Nelson, even you stunk. You're, you're not even number one. And you guys can see on the screen now what happens is as you're entering in your, well, right now it's just a, a statement, but what will eventually be code, it's going to show here. Oh, Chris, and I just, just saw, oh, that's awesome, from Alabama. Cool. Um, what we're looking for, Chris, is in BuzzNet, in the BuzzNet application on the, in your browser you should have a send code button up at the top. And you can see that as I go through and click on stuff, all right, MMO Dust fails completely. Um, Nelson fails. <laughs> all right, so Dementis is our first win winner here. So I, I did. I'm going to pretend I did not. Stealth Coder, again, very nice. So we're going to be able to quickly share what everyone is doing here, and we'll also be able to hold competitions as well just to see, you know, who can do uh, or, and solve problems the fastest. So if I hit disable submission now, what this will do is, or should do, it should disallow you to, um, to do anything else. Nelson, I can't get down to the, uh, oh, that's. We'll make it bigger vertically. Yeah. Let me take it off screen because I can't get to it. Uh, well, or you can zoom out. Yeah, zoom out. So, for those of you, I, I saw a couple of people over there, um, Barry saying that it's still grayed out. Yeah, your BuzzNet is not receiving the notifications that it should. Uh, Marvin says, can't press SIN code. I see it, but can't access it. It should be uh, disabled now. If a minute ago you were unable to hit it, you might be in a similar situation that Barry is in. This is something Nelson's going to have to look into. So that is one thing that we're going to be using. When I ask you guys to submit code, you're going to test it first, um, unless I specify otherwise, over in Xcode or whatever compiler you may be using, and then copy and paste and send it over to us. So that's going to be something that's very useful as we proceed forward. Next thing I want to talk about real quick is over here on 3D Buzz. This is very important to understand. We have a new 3D Buzz website that is coming out very soon. Nelson and I talked earlier today about the possibility here coming up very soon, having you guys all gain access to the beta site because the beta site is designed around the concept of live classes. So that will give all of you guys access to the student dashboard and with the student dashboard you'll be able to easily see what homework is you'll be able to submit homework everything will be streamlined with the current 3d bus site it's not like that unfortunately um, you know we've always done just regular training videos now we're really getting into doing the live material so I just want to point this out for those of you that are new because I know I see there's a lot of new names over here that I'm not familiar with yet from the front page of 3d buzz or anywhere on 3d buzz you can click live classes up in the top from live classes, all you need to do is scroll down to whichever class is the one you have a current interest in, being watch a video uh, that was pre-recorded, 
helping get the password um, or check and see what homework is. So all you need to do is find that particular class, like right now, Objective uh, C Crash Course, click on it. Passwords are always entered into the specific class uh, within five minutes before the start of class. So remember, that's where you're gonna find that. Also, course information and homework. Once homework is available, homework will appear as well. So for example, we can see up here in Thomas Dodd class, if I click on that, you can see that there is a homework link there. You can also see watch the video, and this will allow us to, or allow you to go in and watch the video of the course itself. So remember, for the time being, this live class's calendar is your friend until we get things uh, rocking and rolling <clears throat> with the new site. You'll also notice that you have this legend at the bottom letting you know what each of these blue letters mean so that you can quickly see at a glance. A video, 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 all available. And video will appear for the Objective-C class later tonight. Once the class is over, it takes me about an hour to get everything encoded, uploaded, and entered into the database. And once it's entered, then a V will show up here. Also, when homework goes up later on, the homework, uh, the H will show up here as well. So remember, this is important, and this is where you'll need to be going. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about real quick, as I first look over here at the questions panel, and Jonathan asked, since I have registered to Objective-C Crash Course for tonight, will I have to register each night going forward? That's a fantastic question, sir. No, you will not. For those of you that have registered for this class, you only need to register the one time and that link that you were given, all of that applies each time we meet every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, the only thing that's gonna change will be the password and it will be, again, on the specific uh, class for that night. Yes, Nina. Oh, no, I'm just following along. Oh, okay. Along. And, um, oh, sorry. No, that's My good. stuff's slipping. Just a little bit. I'm slipping. So um, let me go ahead and switch this back over to BuzzNet for a minute because I haven't been able to see what people have, have been saying over here. All right, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that we're going to be using Xcode. We're using version 4.5.2. Um, there are a couple little bugs in version 4.5. Um, one of them that's an interesting one that if uh, there's any of you out there that have not updated to uh, 4.5.2, you may actually see tonight, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, if you are using Windows, if you do not have access to Xcode, you can still follow along because we're gonna be doing a lot of C stuff to begin with um, until we get over into the world of Objective-C. Now, let's see, a basic understanding of computers. <laughs> Please know what a file is, you know, how to copy files around and things like that. Just <laughs> the basics, it's important. Next, dedication, determination, and a lot of patience. That's extremely important for this class. Please remember that. Uh, for those of you that are truly new to learning how to program tonight, uh, you're gonna get frustrated. You're gonna get frustrated a lot. I want you to, to hang in there and have faith and know that Nelson and I will both work with you in every way we possibly can to make sure that you understand the concepts. If not in class and we have to do an open office hours and extra lecture, it doesn't matter. Um, we will do whatever it takes. But in return, what I'm asking for from you guys is that dedication. Just, it's, it's important, okay? So remember, if you're dying, don't, don't just die. Just let us know so that we can help you out. Okay, real quick question that came in over on the questions panel from Chris. I'm sorry, but... Um, I'm not going to say I am stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry, but let's see. I still do not know um, how you are posting to this BuzzNet thing. Uh, Chris, all you need to do is open your web browser and go to buzznet.3dbuzz.com up here at the top. I remember your browser. So if you're only using one monitor and the webinar is full screen right now, of course, you're not going to see your browser but you'll need to get to uh, Chrome or what, whatever browser you use and then go to buzznet.3dbuzz.com and log in with your regular 3D Buzz credentials and then you shall be in the classroom, okay? All right, so good. So hopefully that makes sense. 
All right, so moving on. I'm just scanning over to making sure that nothing else was there. Uh, BuzzNet is still in beta. That's very important to remember, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago. So from time to time, it may do wonky things, and you may be forced to hit refresh. The moment you hit free refresh, you'll just need to log back in with your credentials, and you'll be able to pick right back up. Um, we'll get it fleshed out as uh, good as we can here in the, uh, in the near future. For those of you that do not have Xcode yet installed, but you are on a Mac, please make sure to watch last night's workshop video that was put up. Uh, that just simply walks through where to get it. And I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's Apple. Where to get it and a couple little changes to make in the editor, and that's pretty much it. And for those of you that did not hang out with us last night, you missed out on getting to just hang out and have a good time for a couple of hours after the, uh, the thing. So, yeah. It's good stuff. So um, moving on from there, what are we going to be learning? All right, objective C, obviously. But before we can jump into things like objects and classes and messaging and declared properties and selectors and even getting into discussions about automatic and manual reference counting, we've got to start with the basics. And with objective C, basically, you can think of it as an extension to C. It sits on top of C. So having an understanding of C is extremely important. So that's where we're going to be kicking off at. We're going to be taking a look at what C is, that's, and that's why I say a lot of you guys can, can follow along if you're not using Xcode all the way up to the point in which we jump completely over into Objective-C, and then that's going to be a different story. Okay, so Nelson, we're getting ready to kick things off here, and you're very welcome, Mr. Chris. Glad to see that you were able to make it into BuzzNet. So, Nelson, anything that you want to add to the basic intro stuff that I never have to talk about again in this class? <laughs> I'm sorry. I know right now we've got half the classes asleep. I, and you know how I can tell, guys? Because on my attendees list, it tells me if you are actually looking at the webinar or if you're off the webinar. Like Jan just left the webinar a second ago, but she'll pop back Aww. over any second. Um, <laughs> so... Of, of course, you guys could just be because you're typing over in BuzzNet. So, yeah, they're probably asleep, and I can't really blame them because all the intro stuff is boring. Ooh, I will throw this out because there are a few people that are completely new to our classes. This is very important. In these classes, I, I like presenting things in just the same way that I teach when I'm standing up in front of a classroom. When I taught at the Renaissance Center for seven, eight years, um, same exact thing. You know, I like to do a lot of whiteboarding in Photoshop, since I don't actually have a giant whiteboard behind me to walk over to. <laughs> and I, I like things to be relaxed, and I like getting students involved. That is very important to me. Um, you guys are lucky in the fact that you're not in a classroom, and I can't just, like, walk right over to you and point at you. But at least it's the, the <laughs> next closest thing. I mean, I really harass students in class. But, hey, it's fun, and people learn. This style is not for everyone. There are people out there that, that prefer books and, and just very cut and dry, straightforward you know, content. I totally understand. people. I, I, no, I, <laughs> I totally understand that. Um, but at the same time, when we're doing these long classes, uh, I, I need to keep things interesting for myself <laughs> so that I stay awake too. And, and speaking of long classes, these classes are scheduled for four-hour sessions. Um, tonight... Uh, the content that is, uh, has been designed for tonight is a little bit lighter than the other three weeks because on first night of class, we always go through these uh, logistical issues with students that need help getting into the system and, uh, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, after tonight, it's going to become a little bit more difficult. And no, it's <laughs> session two. He shall be known as Satan Busby. No, the... Uh, Student Slayer is what I was called for. Student Slayer. I'm serious, for a long time. Um, hey, man, I've, I've had students cry before. <laughs> Not that I do it intentionally. So um, let me, if you guys don't mind, I'm now going to move this out of the way. I'm going to come over here to my MacBook. This is where things get really confusing, and, and it's just going to take me just a little bit of time to get used to this. Uh, let me go ahead and switch over to this screen. So look for me. And make me a presenter here. And I'll go ahead and show my screen. Okay, so you guys should now be seeing a whole bunch of blue, correct? 
Yeah, the blue board. All right, good deal. So the bliss, my whiteboard, man, get it straight. The text is all in white. So since we're starting out from the very beginning, the very first thing that we need to do is discuss what a program is. So what exactly is a program? Well, a pro oh, go ahead, Nelson. You, you, you raised your hand. Go for it. Um, the program in it, its simplest form is just a um, it, it is just a group of instructions that take data from the user, manipulate the data, and then return an output. It doesn't at have the simplest to take, level. It doesn't have to take data well, from a user. Not necessarily, and it doesn't have to output data either. But essentially, uh, you can think of a program, a useful program, as an applicate as a as a group of instructions that manipulate data, and that's okay. it. Okay, very good. So yeah, just a series of instructions, um, executable by your computer. So basically, when you run a program, and, and we've all done that as we've managed to make it actually into the uh, webinar tonight, when we run a program, basically a file gets copied over into RAM, and instructions uh, that are contained within that file are executed by your computer. At the lowest level, these, these instructions are instructions for the CPU. And your CPU, the brain of your computer, understands what to do with these instructions because it's native. It's, it's, we're all the way down in machine language, and the CPU can understand what is being said. It's very important to understand. Now, programs come in all different flavors, but I guess you could kind of categorize it into, into just a few. Uh, programs that have user interfaces that people can interact with, generally referred to as applications. We also have programs that have no interfaces whatsoever, and they run like a process, um, known as, as often as processes or um, demons, um, where they sit in the background and they have some specific task that they are handling or waiting to have take place, uh, and then they respond to. Uh, another typical uh, application is a command line tool. And in this course, that is going to be the big thing that we're going to be focusing on is going to be the command line tool. Uh, we're going to be making a lot of those. And the reason is it allows us to get everything out of the way that's confused, confusing to somebody that's learning how to program and focus on just the language. Nelson, anything you want to add to that? Um, no, that sounds good. Okay, so how are programs created? Well, basically, they're written by programmers. You guys all know that because for one reason or another, you're here tonight including those of you that have been programming for a long time. I have honestly no idea why you are here tonight. They just like us. <laughs> they have nothing better to do. Okay. Well, Ashley says she likes learning. I like having her here just hanging out with us, which is very cool. But um, basically, your, your application, your programs are written by programmers, and they're written in a high-level language such as C or C++ or Objective-C, etc., now, what happens is this high-level language is not something that your CPU understands. has no clue whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I wonder how slow this would be if I look on that screen so it's straight. So we got this source code file here. Oh, yeah, drawing it sideways like this is horrible. So we've written wow. a little program. Okay, fine. I'll move That's this impressive. Over. I'm actually legitimately impressed. I really want people to see my desk at some point. And then we have Mr. CP oh, now I hit it now it's all real time. Mr. CPU over here and hang on. And you have Nelson right here and Nelson's the guy who's typing all of this stuff right here. But if the CPU was to look at this and to try to execute it, it's not possible. This is a High, this is how I like to, to write where I can speed things up. High level language. <laughs> we shall call it the HLL today. And you're going to feel like you're in. Anyways, <laughs> so, um, so this is a high level language that you're working with so that, you know, it makes sense to us. Now, of course, it's going to have a set of rules that we need to follow. Uh, there's going to be keywords that the language consists of that we will be utilizing. Um, but how do we get from this, you know, the thing that we want to become, these super cool elite programmers, over to some other file that is basically a binary file that the CPU understands and the CPU is happy. Well, basically, we're going to be writing our code 
and then we're going to be compiling our code. Okay, so in compiling the code, what ends up happening is the files get, and, and we're not going to go too deep into it, but we'll talk a little bit more in just a minute than, uh, than what I'm showing right here. Basically, we're going to take all of our source files, and those source files are going to be converted into... Actually, I, I like the, I prefer the term translate. It's just like you're translating, let's say, from English to German. You need a, a, a medium, like a translator, in order to go from, make that transition from something that you understand to something that something else understands. And that still works, but it's still, con you can also say converting. I like translate. <laughs> you also like ponies. Tomato, so anyways. Tomato. You like ponies. So Everybody likes ponies. So anyways. <laughs> Basically, we're having we're having this uh, this file gets uh, that that's with a high level language. That's something that's easy for us to understand. It gets translated into or converted into a new file that the CPU is able to understand, and it is an executable file that is then able to be executed by the CPU. So, looking over here, I'm jumping over to question. Wow, this is a zero zero one course on RP. RP programming, not even 101. Mr. TC. I thought that was more of a statement. That's yes, it statement. is, but I'm looking back over here because I see him right now. Tiziano, yes, but we need to start out with 15 minutes of covering this stuff so that people understand what's going on because somebody that's completely new to the world of programming might not understand. Yeah, I mean, you can't take that for granted. I, I remember what my first post on 3D Buzz. One of the things I asked is, "What's a compiler?" And I think that's very important to sort of understand the high-level process in order for people to know when they type code into a screen, how that code that they're typing then becomes something that their computer actually performs. And no, Tiziano, I'm not going to get into how to uh, buy a computer. Sorry, man. Everybody here that's actually <laughs> joining into the webinar has a computer, so they've already figured that step out. <laughs> so we see that we've got source files, and these source files need to be converted over by, through some process over into these binary executable files that can be executed by the CPU. So where do we write these source files? I mean, we, we see that Nelson's right here, and we see this file magically appears. Um, generally, it's going to be some form of an editor. Now, the editor that we're going to be using is part of a whole suite of tools called an IDE. And for those of you that are new to the world of programming, an IDE is an integrated development environment. Now, sure, you can open up a text editing program and start coding in there, but you don't have debug ability. You don't have code completion. You don't have um, color coding. There's a lot of things that you, you just you don't have with just a very basic text editor. With an IDE, we have all of these things. And of course, as we all know, the IDE that we're going to be using is Xcode. OK? So yes, ma'am, any more questions over here? No, Are you, you guys you in? <laughs> oh, yes, we are, Barry, um, other than Nelson's in the other room. So now we know Nelson is using an IDE to help him write his source files. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. So now what we need to do is talk about what really happens in that translation process, just so that we have an idea, and then we can move over into more of the world of code and have TC wake back up and join us. All right, so as a matter of fact, let me make sure that I can let's move this all down a little bit. Okay, so what we're looking to get to is from source code over here to a final application, an executable application. So how does this happen? Well, it's really a, a two-step process, if you will. First thing that's going to happen is going to be your files are going to be compiled. And almost always, while it can be a single file, almost always the applications you write are going to consist of multiple files. So again, these are just text files, high-level language. 
We're then going to run the appropriate compiler. COMP, compiler. Yes, Nelson. Well, in this particular case, I just want to qualify that this will be the Objective-C compiler. Every high-level language has a compiler that, associated with it. So if you were writing the C++, you would use a C++ compiler. Th this is true. But unless you want me to hand it over to you, one of the ways I prefer in teaching is we slowly build things up. We don't want to dump too much on them at a time. So to compiler. So we got source files. And this still applies to, because I'm not even talking necessarily about an Objective-C. I'm just talking about in general when we go to compile something. To, to get over I just wanted to I just wanted to clarify that there's not just one compiler thing that you can get that'll work with everything okay fine so basically our source files are compiled and then out of the compiler what we get for each source file is going to be an object file so this is just going to be, I'll just put a dot O. So let's say that this was um, X and this was Y. So this would be like dot X O, or depending on the OS, it could be uh, X dot OBJ, and then uh, Y dot O. So this is what we get coming out of the compiler. Now at this point, this is binary. These are binary files. It is no longer in any sort of form that we can look at and understand ourselves. So this is step one. Now the next step is with the linker. And what the linker is going to do is it's going to link all of these object files together into a linked application. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, why couldn't the compiler just take those source files and compile it right out to an executable? Well, we often use libraries. As a matter of fact, we're, we're going to be using libraries. We're going to be using the C standard library quite a bit. And then we're going to be using uh, some other libraries when we get over into the Objective C world. Now, the C standard library, so we have this other library that's sitting out here that's already pre compiled that's sitting there. So we can say we already got this library that's dot O. And then we have this linker. What the linker is going to do now is it's going to say, all right, give me this guy, give me this guy, and we're using the C standard library and any other libraries that we may be using. And all of these guys then get linked together, and then we have the output being a linked application, an actual executable program. Okay? Anything you want to add to that, Nelson? No. Don't sound so sad. No, I need pretty much covered it. Nope. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you pretty much covered that? it. Um that's that's how it works. And uh looking over here at uh Jonathan where he said that uh compiler is a translator. Um and Jonathan said I always considered them more of a converter than a translator. And and me too. So, I mean, but again, semantics. I totally agree, James. And it's, I like a translator. It, it's going to come down to that with so many different things for those of you that are new to the world of, of programming. As we walk forwards, uh, you guys are going to be introduced to what will at times almost feel like holy wars hmm. um, in some of the things that get debated and argued about. <laughs> a translator and um, – uh, a uh, a converter that's that's not a big holy war, but we will be getting to some of the big things. So, anyways, this is uh, this is very straightforward stuff. Surely, Nelson, you've got something else you want to add to it. I've never heard you so quiet. Come on, talk for a second. Now you can talk about compilers or specific to particular languages, and you can talk about CPUs for a minute. I've I've got everything set up for you. No, no, no. I mean, there's there's not too much to add. I mean, the basic compilation process of any native language like C uh, or Objective-C or C++ uh, is that you start with high-level source files, which basically is just you describe programming as the act of describing your intent to the computer, your intent being um, a serialization or a, a form of something that meets some requirements. So you always start off with some requirement, like you have to write a program that does X. Your job as a programmer is always to take X, turn it into, or serialize it into a group of commands in a high-level language like C or Objective-C, and then it goes through this process to 
turn into an application. This process that Jason outlined is is pretty automatic. It's something that you never really have to dig into, and um, um, it, it's certainly something you have to understand. But it's not a long process. Uh, you can go from source files to a compiled executable in a matter of milliseconds. Um, but like I said, anyway, uh, so this is the process for any native sort of language that you might be working with. And, for um, and it's a very similar project process for most languages, yes. native or not. For, for those of you that are experienced developers, again, I have no idea why you're in the class, um, unless you just like to listen to our voices. This is, this is how I will proceed through this class with doing things with Nelson. Uh, I just saw where Tiziano said over in BuzzNet that Nelson just killed all the noobs using the word serialization. <laughs> um, and Nelson does love to fling around a lot of terminology. And one of the things I'm trying to do as we work our way through the class is keep our true beginners in mind, people that – you know, with things that we take for granted, uh, a true beginner to the world of programming would, would be lost with a lot of the terminology that well, gets well, and, flung in, around. In this particular case, I was I was using the English definition of the word serialize. Um, you literally take a, a, a requirement and you serialize or you transform it into a series of steps um, in a high-level language. I'm not using the, the programming definition of that word. I'm using the English definition of that word. Right. Okay, well, I'm just I'm, I'm going to continue to to baby spoon feed everyone, and then you can come in and jump in with more uh, more involved uh, stuff that they can ignore you if they want. Does that sound good to you? So, yeah, I mean, if people want to ignore me, then fine. But then why am I even here? I'm just kidding. You're so easy. No, everybody loves you now. Uh, uh, what? One thing that someone asked about were dynamic libraries, um, and I don't really want to. I, I that. want to. I, I again want to stay very focused on complete beginners. So that's the only thing I really wanted to say is that, in the process of compiling, just look at it as source files get converted over to these binary files. And the only reason I wanted to even show this was so that you knew where these other libraries, as we're going to be seeing, uh, we're going to be taking advantage of it very soon. The C standard library um, with uh, standard uh, input output. But uh, this is where this, this code comes from and how it ends up becoming part of the stuff that you've written to be a, a final application. And that's the only reason the, I wanted that mentioned. Um, there is one more thing I do want to point out mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it wasn't made uh, explicit as you were discussing this. Um, the final app, if anybody is familiar with, uh, with files on Windows that end with .exe, uh, that's what the final app is. It's a .exe. It's something you can double-click on and run. Uh, the equivalent in Unix-based systems, and Mac OS is a Unix-based system, it's just a binary file. It's an executable binary file, um, something that you can literally just load up with the... Um, uh, with the operating system into memory. Um, in Windows, they're called portable executables. I'm not sure what the actual terminology is for Unix land, but it's something. Um, there is, but long story short, there is no extension really to uh, Unix um, uh, applications. Um, the operating system itself figures out what it needs to do to the file, depending on the file's contents and permissions, not necessarily what extension that file has. Right. Unlike with Windows, where an executable is, is suffixed with .exe. In that case, the Windows will treat it like a portable executable. So I just wanted to clear that up. If anybody was was wondering if we were talking about .e, the, the Mac OS equivalent of a .exe in Windows. Okay, so next thing we're going to do is move over into our first project. Uh, please listen carefully. I am asking you guys not to follow along at this point because you're going to be asked to, to reproduce this stuff as we get over into what I'm calling student challenges. Again, tonight's very, very simple because with such uh, a, a small amount of C that we're being introduced to, it's hard to get you to do anything that's you know really consists of any serious logic or almost any logic at all. Uh, but right now, for those of you that are my complete beginners, don't try to follow. I just want you to watch, and, and if you're taking notes, that's awesome. It's a very smart idea. So what I'm going to do is come over here, and I'm going to go ahead and open up Xcode. And then 
let us go ahead and create a new Xcode project. Now, depending on what all you have installed on your system when you got Xcode set up, I mean, some of you guys might see uh, additional things here. But what we're interested in is up underneath OSX, Application, Command Line Tool. And like I said, we're going to be using uh, command line tools for most of the projects uh, throughout this course. Again, it allows us to focus specifically on the language without anything else getting in the way. So the command line tool, I'm going to hit next. So, so far, super, super simple. Uh, now, I need to give this a project name. So let's call it basic program. Organization name, yeah, whatever, company identifier, buzz sounds great. And then, uh, and these are things that we will, we're not even going to be um, concerned with throughout the intense course, but in the uh, iPhone course, we're going to be talking about uh, some of these things and other settings that are going to become much more important to us. Now, the other thing is the type of program that we're creating or the, uh, the language that we're going to be using is going to be a C. It's going to be a C command line tool, so you want to make sure that it is set over to C. So, so far, this is, everybody should be able to remember this. Very easy stuff. All I did was just made a new project, and then I went in there, and I've given it a project name, and, you know, C, and I'm going to turn off use automatic reference counting. That's stuff that we're going to be talking about in the fourth week. So now I'm just going to go over here to next. It's going to ask where do I want to, uh, to place this, and I'm just going to put it right up under programming, and it's going to create a folder up under programming for me by the name of the project that I just specify. So also, uh, source control. For those of you that are familiar with source control, we're not going to be uh, utilizing this, but we did talk a little bit last night in the workshop about having another workshop in the future, perhaps going over how we can get, uh, get set up and, and how to use it. So we'll make sure to uncheck this and then just simply hit create. Now, first thing that comes up, as those of you in the workshop saw last night, was the most intimidating screen in the world. So if you're new to programming and this is the first thing that you saw, you, you, you know, might want to go running from the building screaming because there's just so much information. But ignore all of it. It's all irrelevant at the moment. It's not really irrelevant, but as far as you're concerned, it's irrelevant. So this is Xcode. This is the IDE in which we're going to be working. So what I'm going to do is come over here to our project navigator. And inside the project navigator, we've got these two different folders. We've got a products folder, and we've got our basic program folder, which is the folder that contains all of our files that we've got in there at the moment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on main.c, and I'm gonna kill everything that's inside it. I don't want nothing there. Ugh. Okay, see, they're, they're so nice. You know, you, you create a command line tool, and they assume every single person that is ever going to create a command line tool is going to do a Hello World. Yeah, it's always going to start with Hello World, so they give you a Hello World app. That's typical Apple for you. <laughs> trying to, you know, trying to be helpful. So I don't want any code in there because I want us to do everything walking forward so that everything makes sense. So I'm going to make the simplest program in the world. Watch this. I'm going to say int main open, close, parentheses. I'm going to do an open curly brace, and I'm going to do a closing curly brace. Yep, there we go. It, it's automatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's it. Can I, can I just point out one quick thing? Yeah. Um, for people who are possibly not watching this at full screen or anything like that, uh, one of the number one problems we have, uh, we see in the forums and people asking, is about the specific um, uh, punctuation that Jason's using. Online two, those are parentheses. You get the parentheses by holding down shift and hitting nine and zero. I shouldn't have to say that. However, the next one, the curly braces. Curly braces are very important, and those are not parentheses. Don't confuse them with parentheses. It'll be an error. I can't count how many times there was a problem with somebody's code, and it was because they use parentheses instead of curly braces. Uh, you get curly braces by holding down shift and hitting the left and right um, brackets keys uh, next to your delete key. So I just wanted to point that out really quickly until we got a question asking about punctuation. And, and my hat's off to you, Nelson. That's a very good one. I just took that one for granted that everyone would be able to find that. But you're absolutely right. We have seen numerous students in the past run into problems with that. Now, for those of you that are already asking, you know, about return and about using void and stuff like that, um, let us build slowly. Remember, 
we're talking to people that have never programmed before. Never. So how in the heck do you know about void? It shouldn't be possible, Jonathan. <laughs> All right. So the simplest program in the world. Now, we talked about to go from source code over to an executable file, our project needs to be built. And Nelson, what is a project? Um, a project uh, doesn't really technically have any anal uh, – it, it isn't really a thing. What can the uh, – wow. Collection? A project – it not really something that the compiler is too concerned with. The project is just a logical grouping of files that you as the programmer decide on. And then typically a project will be responsible for telling the compiler what files it contains, as well as the project settings that you've set right. on the project. Now, keep in mind, you do not need an Xcode project or a Visual Studio project in order to build and write code. But these are tools, uh, like in the case of Xcode or the case of Visual Studio, a project is a tool to logically group together related source files and related settings. That's right. So to get our program here compiled, all we need to do, again, Apple, we've got a giant play button right there. So if you hit the play button. Hey, hey Visual Studio has one of those too. Does it really? I'm, oh, I guess it does, well, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, it's smaller though. Watch it. I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna hit. Run. Da da. Are we all impressed? We should be impressed. Nothing blew up. Our program built successfully. And and let me go ahead and say that real quick. That is another thing that you'll hear me use interchangeably. Uh, compile your application. Build your application. Okay. Um, very important to understand that we're, we're building the application. So this program doesn't really do much of anything at the moment. But it does provide uh, the most important thing that's absolutely required, and that is an entry point. As I said a few minutes ago, you know, programs most of the time consist of multiple source files. How is the CPU going to know where to begin? How is the compiler going to know what to say in the set of instructions that make up the, the final executable file? What the very first thing that needs to take place when the program is run? Well, the way they do this is they, they standardize it so that there is a special function that is going to be the entry point. And this function is called – go ahead. I just wanted to point out that this standardization is on the compiler side, meaning different languages – That's not – let's not talk about different languages. Let's stay focused on okay. just this one language. That, that's – don't want to throw extra words that aren't necessary when we start talking about other languages. That's important for right, our beginners. Well then, what Jason said. So we have to have main and the programs that we are writing here in C. Okay, very important. And this is this is called a function. A program is is nothing more than a whole bunch of functions. And these functions all call one another and send information back and forth. A function is nothing more than a sequence of instructions for something specific to happen. It's very rare you're going to find the main function, and that's, that's the name of this. This function is called main, having a whole lot of code in it. Generally, what happens is we end up you know, calling off to other functions that are going to be handling the bigger picture of getting your application going, which is going to be calling tons of small functions. All, all your functions right. are going to be small functions so that they're easy to maintain and, and they keep the functionality in which they are responsible for very tightly focused to a specific thing as opposed to having a function that's going to do 30 different things. That's a, that's a bad idea. Now, Nelson, well, imagine this one you can jump in on. <laughs> imagine um, the chain of command in military, for example. That's very much how you would structure your... Um, your code, um, where you have, you know, one thing that knows about the existence of a bunch of other things, but doesn't actually know how to do those other things. It just tells other things to do other things and so on. And the further down the chain of command you go, the more menial and small and focused the tasks are. Like a general would be more focused on a broader picture, whereas, you know, some enlisted guy would be only focused on his specific task. Right. I love you, Jonathan. Jumping the gun just a tad. And I promise you I will get to that here very shortly, just slowly building up. Now, we did have a great question asking if, uh, if C is case sensitive, and that 
we'll be talking about that more specifically later, but yes, it is. If I come in here right now and change main to begin with a, uh, a capital M, and again, I'm going to go ahead and run it. But now, instead of coming up here every time, because I'm not a big fan of like having to go to the big play button, I'm going to hit Command R. I'm going to see build failed. And I'm going to see I've got some sort of problem going on. And you can see over here, control reaches in, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to even get into all of the specifics yet. But yes, it is case sensitive. At this point, this program has no main function, the special function called main, which begins with a lowercase m. So I just wanted to, to go ahead and point that out so that you guys do understand it is very case sensitive. So I can have another function that's called main with a capital M, and they would be two completely different functions. But we'll be talking more about that a little bit later on. So here we are with our program that doesn't do much of anything. And so far, what we have got an understanding of is that a program consists of a whole bunch of functions. A functions like a recipe. I'm going to use some analogy stuff real quick. If you were to, to look in any recipe book or if you have one of those little containers that have uh, recipe cards in them and you pull out a recipe for how to make a chocolate cake, that recipe is very specific, how to make a very specific thing. Um, it may require stuff. Um, generally, recipes do require stuff, but it is a series of instructions. Okay. And um, Terry, we'll, we'll get back to you on that one. Um, I don't want to jump in with that just yet. We'll, we'll be talking about methods a little bit later on. Um, but anyways, so again, a recipe, just a series of instructions for a final result, something that you are going to create. And you can think of all of your functions that you're going to be making inside of a program as just a whole bunch of little recipes, all responsible for doing something specific. So, you know, we just had Thanksgiving dinner the other day, and Angela cooked an absolutely awesome dinner. And she used a whole bunch of different recipes for constructing a lot of different things. So you could look at the assembly of Thanksgiving as the program, if you will, and then a whole bunch of recipes, a whole bunch of functions were then called upon in order to create all of the different things that we had for Thanksgiving. So, Nelson, was there something you wanted to add? No. Oh, okay. Just sounded like it for a second. So, inside of our little recipes, inside of our functions here, there's two things that you're going to find. You're going to find code, or you're going to find comments. Now, comments are something that's completely ignored by the compiler. And this is, the, uh, the, yeah, this is the first holy war that you encounter. <laughs> um, comments are a way for you to leave notes for yourself or for another developer about a piece of logic, about how something specific within your code works. So there are two types of comments. We've got single-line comments and we've got multi-line comments. Single line comments are just two slashes, two forward slashes, and that means that everything is ignored on this line. So I can just, everything that gets put in after those two slashes are ignored. You can also see that the uh, color coding is green, indicating that this is stuff that's going to be completely ignored by the compiler. So this is a single line comment. Now there will be times when you're going to need to do multi line comments. A multi line comment begins with a forward slash and an asterisk. And then I can come in here and say, this is a multi-line comment. But we need to end the multi-line comment with the opposite. So we're going to do an asterisk forward slash. And now we're back outside of the comment. So multi-line comment, single line comment. You cannot nest multi-line comments. So if I was to try nesting it, here's what will end up happening. The starting of a new multi-line, this guy right here, oh, you can see we've already got problems. But the, the thing to point out is, let's say that's just, that's just a comment. See how it's green? It's just ignored. It's what's being looked for is that. So once we hit this, this ends the multi-line comment from where we started here. And now this is just, this is just trouble. Okay, so you can't have nested multi-line comments. Of course, within multi-line comments, you can have 
single comments, single line comments like such. Okay. Why would you, why do you need to know that? There may be a point in time later on where you're going to take a chunk of code that has single line comments in it and comment it out. It, it happens, Nelson, they are beginners in this class. So they, again, taking things for granted. And surely you will do that at some point in time. And when you do, single lines will work. But if you've already got a multi-line within a bunch of code that you're trying to do a multi-line comment for, then you're going to end up causing it to uh, the compiling to fail like you've seen here. Now, I said just a second ago that this is where we come to our first little bit of war about comments. You'll find in every academic book that you pick up on programming, you'll find that everybody out there, for the most part, preaches about using comments. And there's a lot of programmers that use comments, and they're very important. And I know for a fact comments have saved my butt in the past. But, Nelson, give your side of comments real quick. <laughs> It's not necessarily my side. It's it's uh, a lot of programmers um, uh, and a lot of programmers not not programmers in academia like the kinds of people who write books, but the kinds of people actually writing code. Um, the problem with comments is well, first of all, I do want to predicate this by saying, uh, or with, um, uh, I don't. I'm not against comments for people who are beginners. Like they can use comments if if that helps them um, remind themselves what a bit of code is doing when when they're still learning how to read code. It might be useful um, for them to to annotate their code with something that allows them to go back and, and quickly understand it. That being said, the goal with with programming should really be to write code that is understandable. Um, in itself, self-describing logic, logic that describes itself. And that's a, a very important practice. And there's a lot of reasons why uh, you should do that anyway. And if you do that, then using comments isn't as necessary. Um, in production code, once you already know how to, how to read code very, very quickly, um, writing comments in production code is is, is a smell. It's, it's you've you've ultimately realized that a particular piece of code is not readable and you've consciously gone in and kludged together something to make it bearable instead of fixing the actual code to make it readable in the first place. So it's, it's an admission of defeat and occasionally it's necessary, particularly when you're inter integrating with, with third parties. Like let's say, let's say I'm writing code that talks to Facebook and Facebook or who a better example, let's say I'm writing code that talks to Amazon payment system <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and let's imagine for a second, of course, this is not the truth at all that Amazon payment systems API completely sucks. And what I mean by that is it's very difficult for my code to, to talk to it, and it's very non-obvious. I might add comment annotations that's, that, that point out areas where the code that I'm being forced to write isn't very clear, and this is how it's, what it's actually doing. This is the bug it's working around and so on. But typically, I see comments as, as is a conscious admission of defeat that you are unwilling to go back and actually correct the code in the first place. That being said, so I, I just wanted to point that out. The reason I want to say that to beginners, because I, again, like I said earlier, I don't care if beginners use code the, uh, comments. If that helps them write code and read code, then, then use them as liberally as you want it, during the learning process. But when you go to introductory material and it tells you that you have to learn how to comment well, and, and the, this is how you comment well, and every line of code should be suffixed by a single line comment, and blah, 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 blah. Just take all that stuff with a grain of salt and realize that, that once you, you've gotten um, good enough at reading code and at writing code, then your goal should be to make the code as readable as any accompanying comment would be. And then just to, um, to counter that, because that sounds all beautiful, rosy, you know, smells good, but sometimes it, it, it doesn't. I personally like being able to go in, and I know Nelson will want to convert over to saying documentation here, but i much rather go in and read a quick summary about how a method works logically as opposed to having to actually, even if it's well-written and well-named, I don't like having to work the logic out in my head and follow it through. 
but you know, you're talking about documentation. Documentation <laughs> what did I just is say? a completely <laughs> is a completely different thing. Um, specifying what a method does and how to use the method that's a form of documentation. Occasionally, software will become so complex that you need to actually document the implementation to where to where you're writing such a complex algorithm that you need to actually document that algorithm. In that case, that's documentation. Those aren't comments. You shouldn't you shouldn't place those comments, the, the, the documentation in line with the code. The documentation should be external to the code, um, either in the same file in a different location or at a different location, perhaps on the internet, or uh, if you're working for a, a company, uh, their internal documentation system. Very good. Like I said, you were going to switch over to talking about documentation. I predicted the future nicely, and I just want to tell James to man up. You don't need sleep. It's time to get serious. Okay, so right now we've got one function, right, guys? Right. The function's called what? Main. Is it an important name? Absolutely. Program's got to have it. We need to know the entry point for our application. Where will the instructions begin executing at? We also know at this point that a program consists of a bunch of different functions. And functions are kind of like recipes. They're nothing more than a series of instructions to do a specific task, which is just like a recipe, isn't it, Nina? That's correct. I mean, when you make chocolate cake, you're looking at a recipe. That's correct. And you follow the, the order of instructions linearly, right? Right. Like you don't start at the very end where it's like, like pull it out of the oven. It's exactly. Like the, the darn thing's not even done yet. So, it, so it's exactly like recipes, Okay. Now, at this point, our program doesn't do anything at all. Yes, James, cake. And now I'm getting hungry. Great. <laughs> our, our program is so boring. We already saw that if I come up here and if I run it, it builds successfully, but there's nothing at all that's going to take place inside of it. Let me go ahead and kill out this multi-line comment. Go ahead. It now. does nothing very explicitly. <laughs> yes. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write – I'm now going to have the program write something out. And the common thing in every book in the world is hello world, okay? So we want to write out hello, I like that, Chris, hello nothing. That's right, we're going to say hello nothing. And we want to write that out to the console. So, uh, and, and to get to the console, if you go up here to view and you come down, I believe it's in debug area, you can activate the con, uh, console. You can also do shift command C as well. Or when we run it in a minute, it'll also bring it up. So I just want to point that out. But anyways, what we want to do is we're going to be using our output down here in the console to actually see stuff happening as we uh, work our way forward through the language. So we want to do something simple. Well, how, how am I going to come in here and tell the computer, tell the CPU how to actually put text on a screen? It's quite complicated, believe it or not. But fortunately we have the, the C standard library available to us, and a lot of common type tasks have already been created for us that we can take advantage of, such as writing out to our console, or if we want it to get information from a user sitting at a keyboard. Uh, those types of things are all done, so we don't have to worry about going in in assembly or or uh, writing low-level code in order to, to do this stuff, you know, the long way. The, we've got these things available to us. Well, what are these things? They're functions. Everything's functions, okay? So, and, and it's going to become all about you learning the functions that are available to you. We've got a lot of great ones that are available in the C standard library, and then as we start exploring other libraries near the end of this course, and then as your programming career advances forward, you're going to find yourself using libraries all the time because there's no reason to go in and reinvent the wheel when you need specific functionality. You'd be surprised the functionality that already exists out there um, that, that you could just, you know, add the library into your project, reference it, and take advantage of it. So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to use printf to say, as Chris suggested, hello nothing to the console. Now... <laughs> And this is, this is print format. So, uh, and, and for those of you that know how to program and you're wondering why am I typing this first, again, just follow along. So I'm going to say printf, and then I'm going to come in here. Since it's a function, 
Okay, I got to call the function name. I'm going to do an open parentheses, and this is where I'm going to have access to uh, what are called arguments. And I'm just going to put double quotes, and I'm going to say double quotes, double quotes, hello, double quotes, nothing. double quotes. Please do not use single quotes. <laughs> That's very important. And I'm going to put they're not interchangeable. And I'm going to put a terminator, and and that is that is correct, Nelson. So I've used printf. And I just, I just happen to already know printf is a function that I can take advantage of that's already been created. It exists out there in the C standard library, which gets linked in to every C program that you do unless you go in there and specifically tell it not to uh, during the linking phase. But uh, here, I'm going to say hello nothing, and I'm going I'm to run this again. So command R. Check this out. A couple interesting things happen. First of all, down here in the console, we have hello nothing that was written out. So it worked. Sweet. That's good. But we didn't do it right. You'll see over here, we've got a warning now that's showing up. And we can see implicitly declaring library function printf. And then blah, blah, blah. It goes on. And there's more information. As a matter of fact, if I come over here into my uh, issue navigator, inside the issue navigator, this is where you're going to see all of your warnings and errors that are going to show up. You can see if I open this up, it's, I love how it pleads with you. Please include the <laughs> header. And let me just open this up for a second just because it's funny. Please include, include the header uh, standard IO, stdio.h. So it needs to know about this. Now, fortunately, since we're already linking against the C standard library, th this was nice enough to implicitly take care of it for us, but we, we wouldn't want to do this. Uh, so what we want to do is we need to make our program aware of this printf. We, we need to make it aware of it and how we need to speak to it, how we need to talk to it. How, how does it know that it's expecting to receive uh, this parameter that we're sending in? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to use what is called a preprocessor pre -processor, um, directive. And I'm going to tell this guy that we're going to include stdio.h, like such. Wow, the moment I hit enter, over here in my issue navigator, it went to no issues whatsoever. So let's go ahead and just jump back over here to the project navigator. And if I hit command R again, build succeeded, hello nothing, got written out to our console. And the program is completely happy. Okay. Happy programs, good programs. So uh, I, I just uh, happened to see over in the in BuzzNet. Um, I, I'm forced to look at it just a little bit more because it is um, it's right behind my MacBook. It's kind of funny how things are lining up this time around. Uh, generally, when you guys want uh, questions answered, make sure to put them over in the uh, the questions panel. Um, if, and but feel free to ask questions over in BuzzNet. Just know that it'll be other students that generally answer those. We don't always see them, but I did happen to see Chris ask, and I know that a lot of you guys already responded with an answer. But what is um, STDIO? That's standard input output. Okay, so this is a uh, a special header file. This header file contains. The, the declaration of these guys, how there is, is a prototype of, of what printf looks like. Okay. And let me take a look over here. Chris, you're very welcome, sir. And Jonathan, yes. Um, because it's, it's good programming practice, especially if you are, and I apologize, he's just asking about this being a, um, something that's taken place during compiling and how Xcode's handling this for you. Um, if, if you're writing a, uh, a C application and you're using, or even C++ and you're using Xcode, but then you take this over to another computer, uh, an, uh, let's say a Linux box with a, uh, a different IDE setup, different compiler, the whole nine yards, um, you don't, you don't want to rely on the things that Xcode does for you. So in this particular case, this is how you do it. If we're going to be taking advantage of functionality, Nelson, if you want to jump in and say something, go ahead. Oh, I was just answering a more advanced question, wasn't it? Oh, okay. So if you want to take advantage of a particular 
function, one that you have not written yourself, but that's part of a library, you're going to need to make sure that you include with the program that you're, with this program file, this source file, uh, where they, that um, declaration of that function is. So by the time we get down here and we're using this, at this point, we're completely aware of printf because printf is defined or, or excuse me, declared inside of standard io.h. Okay, so now we can actually write something out. Hello, nothing. So we're going to do two things real fast. We're going to go on break, and you guys have your very first uh, assignment, and that assignment is to go ahead and create your first project and do the basic hello world. Okay, so we're now on break, so I'm going to pause video for... Uh, time's sake. All right, welcome back, everyone. So we have now resumed, and what I'd like to do is bring up view code and switch over real quick to blue screen. And some missions that we've got. And look at that, Jonathan got it in first. I didn't say anything about. Well, well, well yeah. Well, that what, what's zero. this return zero? Oh. I, I, no. What does that mean? I don't even know. Yeah, what that I, means. I don't know. I, what's that? What well, he's he's just crossed the line. I can't believe that. <laughs> Dementis. Very nice, sir. Very. See, see, Jonathan. That's how it's done. Mr. Stealth Coder, right up there. Look at look at that beautiful execution. Very nice. Good deal. So, so far, what, what, what's this? Wait, wait, no, hang on. What's this? Hello, world. Oh, it just, that's just so, look at that. Let's use what Chris said. Hello, nothing. World. Isn't coding fun? <laughs> <laughs> it will be. So, <laughs> <laughs> hungry, James? <laughs> Jen, come on, let's be creative. Ashley. <sighs> yeah, you can see she just got out of college not long ago. All right. Void. What's this void stuff? I never mentioned void. See, ah, oh, return zero. And is that this the scroll bar -y thing, Nelson, is... Yeah, I, I'm not going to be able to scroll all the way down myself unless uh, I don't want to start zooming everything. Um, yeah. Zoom, zoom, zoom. There we go. Clicked on it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> what in the world? Oh, man. Oh, my. So, welcome to the crash course of 3D Buzz uh, from Argentina. Very cool. Bienvenido. <laughs> so, all right. Overall, not bad. Okay, good deal. <laughs> so let's go ahead and uh, jump back over here to the, the webinar panel real quick. Nelson, any comments that you've gotten there? I'd probably be good if I unmuted myself. Yes, yeah, generally um, that is. No. Okay, so here we are back to showing my screen. So as you guys saw, let me minimize this guy that you guys can't see. There we go. So back over here in code. As you guys saw, there were a few people that had the return zero. And let me talk about that real quick. So for a function, and in a second, we're going to look at the anatomy of a, of a basic program, basically this one right here. And when we do that, uh, this will probably make more sense. But all functions always have their code inside of or blocked in an open and a closing curly brace. Okay, so open curly brace, all the stuff that belongs to this function, closing curly brace. You'll also see that everything is indented with a tab. And when indenting, it's not with spaces, it's actually with a tab. And I do want to point this out real quick for those of you that were not in the workshop last night, in case you're not seeing any of your uh, line numbers right there. If in Xcode you go up to the Xcode menu and come down to Preferences. And from inside of Preferences, if you jump over to the text editing, inside text editing, make sure line numbers is on. That's going to be very helpful to us a little bit later on for, uh, and hang on, I'm trying to close out of 
that BuzzNet thing. There we go. Okay, so make sure that line number is on, and then over on indentation, uh, make sure that your preferred indent using is uh, with tabs. Okay. So I just wanted to point those two things out real quick. So we're gonna we're gonna talk more about formatting here very soon, but I do want to point out that these uh, these this code that's inside of the main function has been tabbed over, and it's something that deals with just formatting your code for readability. The compiler could care less. So that's I, I just want to point that out. So with this function, there is this int over here, and int's a data type. It's an integer. It's a whole number. And what we're doing is we're basically saying what this method can return. And as you saw, some people had void up there. Say, and void literally means nothing. Okay, so there there is not going to be a return. But typically, you're going to see an int up here with main, and that allows you to return a value back. And this is something that will be irrelevant to you as we work our way through this class. But if you were to write a program that utilized another program that might need to read error codes that came back from that other program, this is one way that you could, that you would do it. I mean, this is how you'd do it. So just to make this all nice and complete, now you'll notice that we, we don't have any warnings or anything. It's, everything's happy. But what I'm gonna do is just come in here and say return zero terminator. So didn't make any difference whatsoever. Go ahead, Nelson. Well, I mean, do you, do you mind if I try and try to come up with an analogy for return types, or are you going to go into return types more in detail later? Well, I was actually going to go into it more later when we actually talk about functions and all. But give it a give it a quick go. All right. Let's see if I if I succeed at this or fail. Uh, just to, just to give people an idea about it in relation to Jason's earlier analogy about recipes. If every function is a recipe, every recipe has an end result. For example, if you were to bake a cake, the ultimate end result is going to be a cake. So that would be the thing that you give back to the person invoking the recipe. You don't give back a, a sink or any of the intermediate things that you use to create the cake, like a bowl or any of the utensils that you used or an oven or anything like that. You ultimately return a cake. So you need to tell the, the, the C compiler what it is that your function is going to give back to the person who invoked it. In this case, we're specifying that it returns, it's the return type, a whole number. And then on line seven there, Jason put in um, return zero. I do have a question for everybody real quickly. Um, for the, this, only people who are completely new to programming, I want you to answer this, this quick question. What would the output of this program be if Jason swapped line six and seven? And again, that is addressed only to those that are completely new. But keep keep this in mind. See, they haven't actually been told what return does. Yeah, exa exactly. I'm saying nothing. Okay. So Nina said nothing. Dementa said nothing or error. And uh, Chris said nothing. And then uh, Tokyo Drip said zero. And Chris Chandler or Chris said nothing. I mean, I, I know we haven't explained it yet, but I was just wondering if anybody could, um, you know, I, I generally like seeing if people can guess as to what something might happen. So go ahead. We have. Because I think that's a good skill. So we have a whole bunch of uh, people over there that have, have thrown out answers. Go ahead, Nelson. Uh, so the answer would be uh, nothing. Um, and the reason is, is that the return zero is saying, is basically throwing your hands up and saying, okay, this recipe's done, go away. Um, there's no more code to execute, the function is done. And so by specifying the return zero before the printf, uh, the printf never gets hit by the CPU. The CPU just basically ignores it. Well, and that's exactly what return means. Return means to, to exit out. Uh, the fact that we're actually using an expression over here, we're, we're sending zero back out, it's because this function expects to be able to send something back, and that's a value that then could be available to another application that invoked this application if it so wanted to 
utilize that information because it could be an error code or, or something else. But swapping the two lines like Nelson had just said and hitting Command R to build and run, just like uh, Nelson said, nothing, nothing is, is what we see here. So there, the, the output, as far as I think what Nelson was looking for is the output in the, the console, what, what is going to actually be seen. Um, the, the zero that's being sent back would have to be something that would need to be uh, intercepted and utilized by another program. Right. Um, because of the way the program is now constructed, the printf function never gets invoked, never gets called, never gets told to run. And also, uh, Chris did ask about uh, zero related. Is it uh, related to the binary system, zero and ones? No. No, it's not. That's, that's why I was saying using it as a, an error code. So you could say error code 12, you know, so you could return a 12 or something like that if need be. So I just wanted to go ahead and, and actually show that. So what do you think about my, my analogy? You did Jason? good. I like how you actually used the recipe thing, and, and it was spot on. It was awesome. It was very nice. So now what I want to do is jump over here for just a second to Photoshop and add a new layer. And this is, this is oops, wrong one. And this is, uh, again, an area where all of you guys that have been coding forever can, can just go to sleep, okay? Good. No, Take no. a nap. Go work on something else. And those of you that are truly new to programming, please pay close attention. So I'm going to come in here and say, and, and doing this is, is very important to me. Input stdio.h. And then we're going input. to do what now? In, include. Thank you. Let me change that. I'm looking at my other computer over at BuzzNet, and that's what I get. Now you know how it feels. It, no, I know how it feels. And then I'm going to jump down here with int, and let me get that out of my way. Int main. printf, hello, that is an O, <laughs> nothing, and then return zero, and then closing off my curly brace. Okay, so what I want to do is just go over the anatomy of a very, very simple program. So this very first thing up here, as I mentioned earlier, was called a what? Anybody remember? Quick, over in BuzzNet. Three, two, one. Jonathan, you're too slow. This was our preprocessor directive. Um, directive. Oh, very good. Jonathan got shown up. All right, so, oh, waiting. I see how this is going to go. So, again, this is our pre-processor directive. They start with a pound, and then what this is, basically, it's an instruction to the compiler to do something. So this is just before everything else. Be before the compiling happens. And in this particular case, what it's telling the compiler is that we want to include the standard io.h file. This is a header file. And wow, actually drawing on a piece of paper, that was funny. So this is this is a header file that is being told to be included in with this file here. Now, the fact that we've got these less than and greater than symbols around them is important, but we're going to be talking about the difference between those and double quotes later on when we get into the actual um, usage of header files. And Chris, we will be talking about terminators in just a second. Okay, so very simple, straightforward um, preprocessor directive. Uh, later on, uh, time depending, we might be able to look at macros and, and some other cool things that we can do with them as well. All right, from there, we know that this entire section right here is a what? Quick, somebody put it over in BuzzNet. It is a, a right, Nina, Nina, Nina can play too. That's right, very good, Jen. It is a function. 
Awesome job, Nina. And Jen, way to go. All right, so we've got a function, and with the function, we always, always have a function name. So right here, this is our function name. Think about it. Recipes. If recipes didn't have a title, if they didn't have a name, you wouldn't know what the heck you're making. So if you're going to make a um, devil chocolate cake, well, that's the name of it. Go make, you know, you're going to invoke the devil chocolate cake, which means you're then going to follow the instructions. And what are you going to return? A devil chocolate cake. Chocolate cake. That's right. So we've got to have a function name. We'll always have a function name. Next thing that we have right here, and we're going to be spending a lot of time on this. I'm just going through this quick, quick anatomy of a, a simple program. So I do want to mention this. This is the parameter list. So parameter list. What is in our parameter list right now? Anyone? Yes. What you, nothing. Look at that. Nina has never coded a day in her life. Okay, that's, that's not true. She's, she's looked for a couple seconds at C sharp. But there's no parameters. This is an empty parameter list, okay? So it's nothing. So what would be parameters just so that you have a, a basic idea? Well, let's think about our recipe. The recipe requires, let's say, three eggs. Well, it needs to take in three eggs so that you'll have three eggs in which to go about creating whatever it is that you are making. Okay? So, and looking over in the questions panel. And Terry says, if return zero is included or omitted, the file compiles just fine, which is considered proper style. You should always have the return there, sir. Very good question. Okay, so... Continuing on, so the parameter list is nothing. This is information that we can send to this function. Now, when you first created your project before you deleted the code out, you may have noticed that there were some things in the parameter list. And those things that were in the parameter list allow you to, when executing the program, to send information to the program. And you guys have all seen this before. If you go to execute a program, um, and, and you, like, let's say you're going to open a text editor, and so you say edit, let's say you're using like edit.exe or, or notebook or um, notepad.exe, space, and then you give the name of a, a file and hit enter, and that file suddenly just opens up. That additional information that you sent into the notepad or edit.exe executable uh, is then accessed through those uh, incoming parameters, okay? So, um, Next thing that I want to point out is we've already set it lightly. And again, we're going to be retouching on this heavily when we go over writing our own functions. But this is what again? It's the return type. And what's an integer, ladies and gentlemen? Quick. It's a data type. Right. What kind of data is it? Nina. Oh, God. Integer. Good answer. It's a number. <laughs> Sorry. Right. It's good, Chris. It's a number. But not just any number. It is a... It's a counting number. That's very... <laughs> good job. Very good. Uh, both Jen and... Uh, what is that? Exion? Um, if, if that's how to pronounce it. Uh, official? Yes. It's a whole number. Okay. Outstanding. Good. So now I know oh. how to say your name. I so, just blew and it is, And it is not... A phone number. See, I can. I just realized I can start treating Nina like a student too. I know, and I You're just blew doomed. it under pressure. I did. I just. Went, You're, I was like, Dee. you better really pay attention now, because I I'm really. Like, I, and I was. I That's the sad do. thing. So, so ignore, ignore both Tokyo Drip and, uh, well, just ignore Tokyo Drip, uh, because it's not a serial number and it's not a phone number. It is a whole number. Okay, uh, again, stuff we'll be coming back to later. So now. Okay. Inside, because we know that a function, after its name, its return type, its parameter list, has an open and a closing curly brace always, okay? Right. Can't be parentheses, can't be square brackets. It has to be an open and a closing curly brace. Inside is a giant dialog box. Inside is the code that belongs to that function. Okay, so this is statements. These are, these are the statements. That's right. These are code statements. Okay. Unless it's a comment, then it's not a statement. So again, and well, then it's a nothing. <laughs> it, it is a nothing. That's right. The two things that you find inside of a function is what? Statement. 
I, I just I like to simplify it to just code, code and comments. Code and comments makes it okay. very simple. Code and comments. Code and comments. Got it. Okay, so let me go ahead and take. Oh, oh. Let me take that guy out too. There we go. Okay, so we now have our body, our function body. Start out with a comment, but as I mentioned a few minutes ago, all this stuff is indented over. By having all of this stuff indented over, we can quickly look at it. So this is, this is just kind of how my eye is looking at it. We see all this stuff indented over, and we just follow it back to the guy that's not indented, and boom, I can immediately see who all this belongs to. And when does that become important? Well, it's, well, it's important all the time. Again, readability. But if you have a, a huge function that is uh, that basically goes outside of your window, right? So you have to scroll through it. Well, first of all, Nelson's going to show up at your place and probably smack you because you should <laughs> never have huge functions like that. But again, you can just quickly look, and as you're scrolling, you can see what everything is indented belongs to. If all of this code was all flush. It would be a complete pain, especially in a large program, to be able to tell what belonged to what. Yeah. And as we start having things inside of a function, when we start working with loops and we start working with if statements, etc., we're going to have things indented over even further and so that we can tell what that code belongs to. So I just wanted to, uh, to point that out. Again, this is formatting and we'll be spending more and more time on formatting as we work our way forward. So inside we know that we've got this comment and as we already know that it's ignored by the what, Nina? Um, oh God. By the compiler. By the, by the compiler. Good yeah. answer. Ignores it. Ignores yeah. it altogether. So this next line, print F, what is this? Oh God. What is this? Come on guys, you can do it. Anyone, just put it over in BuzzNet. Print F is a... Command, function, oh. very good. Okay, it is a function call. Nelson has used the fancy word twice. I've used it once. We're invoking a method. We're calling. Oh. Go ahead. You said method. Oh, oh I mean C sharp, yeah. No, oh. we, we do have to be careful about that because that will unfortunately confuse people. Yeah, no, it's functions, though we will be introducing you to methods when we get over into the objective C part. <laughs> They're not even called methods, are uh, they? Yes. Well, well no, we'll, we'll be dealing with methods when we get over into objective C with messages so and all that. Okay. F is but, a function. But, um, I mean, no. <laughs> Tokyo Drip, no! Function, just function only. This is function, a function, function call. Function. <laughs> Dang it, pretend I never said method. It was an accident, it slipped. Um, other programming languages. Okay, so printf is a call. We're now actually saying utilize this, this function called printf. We're handing over to printf for it to do its thing, and we're sending information over to it. So you're, you're actually seeing two interesting things here if you think about it. You're seeing this whole thing. This right here is us defining a method. Uh, go, go ahead. Function. Ah, function. Function. You function. did that to me, Nelson. <laughs> this, is, this is us actually defining a function. So we've got our header in there, we've got the function name, and then we've got all the code inside of it. And in this particular case, it's going to end up being used by the application getting executed, and this is our entry point. Any additional functions that I define in here inside my source code will not get called upon or invoked unless I explicitly call it. And that's what we're doing with printf. We're simply calling upon this and we're handing execution over to the code inside of printf. We don't have access to that code. That, that code is, it's already been pre-compiled for us and does all of its nitty gritty stuff in order to take whatever you send into it to write it out to our console, okay? So, that's very important. Just, we're calling upon a function to do work. Now, as Nelson mentioned earlier, this is a statement. statement. All statements are going to end with a terminator. Well, when we start getting into if statements, there are, there are special rules that will apply in specific cases. We'll talk about those. But the terminator is what is going to tell the compiler this is the end of this statement. <laughs> this is the end. Oh, I can't do an Arnold Schwarzenegger voice. 
but I wanted to do an Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger voice and then do this at the end of the statement. You get it? That would have been really funny. Okie <laughs> <laughs> dokie. This is the end of the statement. So, yes. The Terminator. Yes, get it? No, Come on. I get it. I get it. Ugh. I get it. Another, I was trying to be funny. Another very common mistake for beginners is leaving off the Terminator. If you leave off a Terminator, your code will explode. Okay? So make sure that you make sure your Terminators are there. Now, up, this is not a statement up top. Notice there's no Terminator at the end. This is us telling the compiler before all of this gets compiled. We're like, yeah, say, what's up, compiler? Before you start putting all this together, please make sure to include the standard I.O. header so that we can utilize functions down inside of this file here, and you know what they are. They've already been declared. And, that, and that's going to make a whole lot more sense when we actually start writing our own headers, okay? But it, it at least lets the the compiler know when we get down to this printf exactly what printf looks like, okay? So with that, the, the next thing, so this, term, this semicolon is called a terminator. 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 And this whole printf thing is called a, I'm just going to put function call. You'll hear a lot of people say, Function call, calling the function. You'll also hear invoking the function as well. Basically, we're just handing execution control into that function for it to go through its series of statements, and then it'll return back to us. And once it returns back to us, we'll just pick up with the very next line, just like the recipe. It's linear. There is no magic behind how a program executes. It has a starting point. It knows to start inside main, and then it starts at the first executable piece of code. This isn't executable. That's a comment. It, it doesn't even see that. It ignores it. That makes this line right here, printf, the very first line of code. That is where execution begins, okay? All right. So finally, we have return here. Well, if, if I was new getting into this, I, I would be asking, so does that mean that return is a function? New. No. Return is not a function. We're working in the language of C. In all of the different languages that you can work with out there, they all have keywords. These are reserved keywords that make up the language. So with C, there's, um, there, there's not a whole lot of them, believe it or not. So of the different uh, keywords that are reserved that, I mean, right now we're seeing int. Int's a reserved keyword. We're seeing return, again, a reserved keyword. If a return, or excuse me, a, um, another reserved keyword. There's, there's a handful of them, and we will be, uh, we'll be exploring a lot of them throughout this course. So again, for the beginners, function call. Actual key word that's part of the language itself. Nelson, do you want to expand upon keyword? Um, well, language spec, a keyword, like, like you said, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, every, every, language, every language has a set of rules, and most of the time languages have what are called keywords, like what just Jason just described. Uh, a keyword is just a built-in, it's, it's a reserved name for something. Um, and in this case, that's the return keyword. It's still a statement. It, it, it's not, you're not invoking a function, it's still a statement. Um, but it's a different kind of statement, it's a return statement, instead of the statement above it, which is a function invocation statement. Right. Very good. Okay. <laughs> I, sorry, I didn't. I didn't have anything. No, you. More to say. In, in one of our previous programming classes, you went off about keywords. So I just thought I'd give you an opportunity to expand upon that if you wanted to, because before you had got into, you know, the spec, the language spec, and how it has a, a you know a specific set of keywords that have a specific set of of functionality, and then all of this is glued together by rules, and this is called syntax, the syntax of the language. Right. So I was just giving you a chance to he jump was, back. He on, just said, "Yeah, what you said." Yeah, I. I <laughs> yeah, yeah, you summed up. Uh, that's 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 what it is. Um, uh, all a language is 
that I mean that's all the language is is a bunch of rules. Yeah, and, and keywords. Um, key, keywords are a, an aspect of those rules, um, as as is um, punctuation. So just like how English has its own punctuation, um, programming languages have their own punctuation. Yeah, and keywords get recognized by the compiler. And they do specific things depending on what's going on. For example, int is a keyword. Uh, I think, believe, like Jason already mentioned, that specifies that you have a, a int integer return type or an integer type for anything, and then returns another keyword that just has special instructions that the compiler knows what to do. The compiler doesn't know what printf is. No, um, no clue whatsoever. Print, yeah, printf was something that was defined by the people who wrote the standard library. And a standard library is a collection of code that kind of gets married to a programming language. Um, it's not part of the language per se, but it's very commonly included with the language. So the standard library defines printf, but the C compiler doesn't really know what printf is or what it means, but it does know what return means. And Ultimately, at the end of the day, if you look into the definition of printf, then you look into the definition of all the functions printf invokes, and so on, and so on, and so on. At the end of the day, you're going to run into code that's literally just keywords, but they've all been grouped together into functions and abstracted away and blah, 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 until we can just call printf to print out code or print out text I mean, and words and stuff. You could almost look at, so this is like a recipe, right? Which in programming language, this is a what? This is a function. So here's main, and then here are a bunch of other functions, and then perhaps here's a library filled with, let's just, I'll keep it really simple, a bunch of functions. Execution has to start on that very first executable line inside here, and then from there we may invoke this guy, this guy may do a little bit of work, and then this guy might invoke this guy, and then after this guy does his little bit of work, and we that means we return back to him, and then we come back in here, maybe we invoke this guy, and this guy makes use of something that's in this library over here by calling upon this function. This function does some stuff, and then once it's done, it's going to return back to whoever invoked it, which means we'll go back to the next line here. And then when this guy ends, that means he returns back. And finally, when this guy here, the last guy ends, we return back to where we called right there. And if there's nothing else in main to execute, we're done. It's the end of the program. That's a very high-level look. At a at a program, wouldn't you agree, Nelson? Yeah, yeah, and it, I know that we've been using the recipe analogy, but if you go back to the chain of command uh, analogy, that's very similar to what a chain of command looks like. Mm -hmm. So, this is, uh, and again, we're we're about to get away from this, but I, I just wanted to to walk through the anatomy of a very simple program and take a look at all of these these different pieces. You know, it, it's really going to come down to the, the biggest thing is once you understand what's going on with variables, how to store data, how to pull the data uh, back out of variables and use them, how to write functions, how to write your own, and, and that's very easy stuff. And then um, that's, that's the two biggest things. And then once you learn how to make decisions and loop, you can be dangerous. That. I, I, yeah, you can be deadly. That I promise you. So there's, there's not a whole lot to it. People just get themselves tripped up on, on logic. Well, people that are completely new get themselves tripped up on the syntax, just the way it looks. Oh, it's so cryptic. It's scary. I see these opening and closing parentheses. How do I, how do I know if I'm going to use it? Well, it's a function. You always use it if you're defining the actual function. So this, this will all become something that's very repetitive. You're going to be using it over and over and over, and, and you'll become very comfortable looking at this stuff. Nina, were you going to ask or say something? Oh, I was, hello, nothing. That's an argument, correct? Is that what that is? That's yes, what, yeah, that, is okay. an, that is an argument that we are passing to the parameter list of printf. I'm just um, trying to Which is to going to take that information in. in. <laughs> yep, that's, that's very good. So there you go. Any questions, any Questions from a beginner that are relevant to the basic syntax and what we've discussed here. I want to keep this very focused at the moment. All right, I'll give you guys a second if you have anything to put in there, but I'm going to go ahead and move on. I want to jump back over here to Xcode.
and ba -doom. and let's let's do something else really cool let's print out something else print f let's say um now notice when i go to to print something out i'm always putting this stuff inside of these two double quotes okay the stuff that is inside, these, these double quotes are delimiters. Basically, we're saying everything that's inside here is going to be treated just as a string of characters. It has no specific meaning or anything. It's just a string of text that we're going to do something with. So we said, hello, nothing. Hey, look. It's, a, it's another line. Or is it? Is it? Ah, I already beat you. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Okay, so notice once again that we're back over here that I just want to reiterate at the end of these statements that I've got a terminator at the end of both and, and this statement down here as well. So terminator. Now, if I was to execute this now, again, the application is going to be rebuilt, so recompiled and all. And then when execution begins, it begins inside of main. I know I'm saying this over and over and over, just drilling it into your heads. Uh, so first line that's going to actually get executed is right here, which is going to call on the function printf, and it's going to put hello world or hello nothing, excuse me, out to the console. Once this statement is done, we then move on to the next line. Once that statement's done, we move on to the next line. That's another thing that I've seen a lot of beginners have a hard time getting their head around. It's really that simple. It's a linear, it's, a, it's executed in sequence and in order, just from one line to the next, okay? So here we're gonna print out two different things and we're going to say return zero at the very end and that's going to end the program. Let me go ahead and do a command R to run this and let's take a look at what we have. And let me drag this over just a little bit. So my output shows, hello nothing, exclamation point, hey look, it's another line. But it's all on the same line. Uh -oh. Why? We haven't, we haven't actually done anything to, to tell printf that we're going to be outputting on another line. We haven't done a carriage return and a, and a line feed. Okay, so we need to do a new line. So how do we tell it new line? Well, this allows me to introduce you to something else you're going to be using a lot, and that is escape sequences. So escape sequence, uh, an escape sequence is a backslash and a character that is going to have some sort of special functionality inside of this set of characters. So what we're wanting to do is we want to basically put a, an like you hitting the enter key inside of here. So there's a few different ones. If I was to jump back over real quick into Photoshop, uh, just to, to show you guys. So slash in, this is gonna be for a new line. There's a bunch of these, there's just only a few that I'm wanting to show at the moment. Uh, slash, slash. What happens if you're in a situation where you actually want a slash to be written out, just to, to have it just be a, a regular character? This is how you would do it. So that would put that in the string of text that is being utilized for whatever function you're calling, in this case, writing out to the console. Okay, what if we wanted to put double quotes? Because we already saw double quotes, it's gonna start and it's gonna end designation of where our string of characters are, but what if I wanted to actually print out to the console or show on the console double quotes? So if I do the, the slash with the, uh, the double quotes in there, then that's simply going to put that character out. And then one more, just because I'm going to use it sometime very soon, is uh, the slash T, and this is going to be the same thing as hitting a tab. Okay, so um, so there you guys go. So those are, oh boy, my writing is horrible. So <laughs> slash in, slash, 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 double quotes, slash T. There are several other ones, but this is all I'm going to focus on right now, the ones that we're going to actually need. 
So let's go ahead and jump back over to Xcode and let's fix our problem where we wanted to put our text, hey look, it's another line on another line. So if I just come up here right now and simply say backslash in, that's going to do what I'm looking for. Notice it is inside the string. It's inside these double quotes. So now if I come in here and do a command R to run this again, look down here at our output. Hello, nothing. Hey, look, it's another line. Okay. Very, very simple stuff. So what if I want it there to be Nina? Let's say I wanted to put an extra line with nothing between hello, nothing, and then I want a blank line there, and then I want, hey, look, it's another line. How would I go about doing that? Could you put two of those? Look at you go. So now if I just put two of these, it's like hitting the enter key twice. So if I say command R to build and run, hello, nothing, hey, look, Yay. it's another line. Pretty straightforward? Pretty simple? Sweet. So I think it's about time to give you guys another assignment, another little challenge, except I don't want you copying exactly what I have up there. Um, so I'm going to, this is just going to be, no, I know how I'll do this. I'll do it on the whiteboard. <laughs> right Skynet. Uh, right Skynet, yes. <laughs> a, a very, very simple one. So what I want you guys to do is write a very simple program. Wait a minute. Uh, Jen just asked over here, any specific reason to put it on the first line, not the second line of printf? Oh, nope, you can do that as well, real quick, I just because uh, that's a good point. Just want, oh, you could have hey, put it before. Nelson, I'll, you, I'll, show while you go, I'll show while you go ahead and uh, give your thoughts. I really don't like having uh, new lines uh, prefixed on um, that because it just, if, well, first of all, it just looks awful. <clears throat> and second of all, you're giving the responsibility of positioning that line to the line itself and not the line above it. So it's less extensible than if you were to just suffix the line above it with a new one. It just doesn't make as much sense and it looks bad. So if I And now it doesn't line up. Like the hello nothing and the hey look doesn't line up. I mean there's not, just and no and he's not talking about what's way. being output. He's talking about again, we go back to readability with our code. So now the, this string doesn't start off with this string right there. This is now hard to read. So if you think about it, that's, that's right. hard to read compared to that right there. Looks neater. And, yeah, and for people who are familiar with CSS, you know that in CSS it's good practice to um, not position things um, – not position, it's better to push down than push up. It's more extensible to push down than push up, if that makes sense. What's this going to do? I completely failed on that. I'm sorry. But if a person knows CSS well, they'll know what I'm talking about. What's that about. do? I just, I just put a slash, not, not you. Nina, what a slash in. I oh. just, what, what's my output going to be right here? If I had to guess, I would think. Guess? Don't no, guess. Another we line, know. Another line would be like enter so what, down below. Okay, hey, so, so describe the output. Describe it. It would be hello, nothing. Good. Then two, then a blank space. Okay. Then hey, look, it's. Then, a, it, and then another line would yes, be. Yes, awesome. So let's go ahead and. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, hold what, on, hold on. What did I do? Oh, oh, is it another? Is it just another line explanation point? Is it just another space line explanation point, or is it something else that's going to be printed? Wait, what? I, I know what Nelson's getting at. I, I wasn't going to drill her that hard, oh, but I'll. No, I don't know. I don't there, know. There, this is a this is a character too. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay. Oh, so so it'll be like a like a space. Yeah. And then another line. Yes. But that would be down below. Hey, look, it's right. That's that's right. Okay. Exactly. So it'll be. Um, not aligned. Oh. <laughs> so let's go ahead and run this, and that's... Oh, look. Yep. I was right. <laughs> Very good. Nice job, Nina. Very nice. <laughs> Nina is the voice of the class, and you guys are just fingers to do your voice. Yes. Okay, so let's jump over here and give a real quick, simple exercise that everybody will be submitting. Um, uh, Nelson, if you can go ahead and end the participate... Well, it has been ended. Set up a new participate and... Um, Give the name as uh, Basic Info Program. And then let me go ahead and jump back over here to Photoshop. And I want you to write me a program, everybody, that is just going to say 
basic info, let's see, info about me, colon, and then I want it to say name, colon, and in your name, not mine, <laughs> well, I'm going to put Jason, and I want it to be in double quotes, and then I want on the next line, age, colon, and then lined up over here with this guy, I want, oh God, I'm getting old. I really, I really am getting old. I want that. So this is the output that I'm looking for. So two important things to note here is that name and age are aligned, but they're indented. Do not do this with spacing, okay? Also, these guys are aligned as well, and they have the double quotes around them. So this is what I want to see printed out when you actually execute the program. Very simple stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video. And ladies and gentlemen, go ahead and get jamming on that. Plus, we're, we're very close. We're, we're almost at another hour of recorded content, which means we will also tie this in with a break as well. So it'll be a 10-minute break. We're pausing video now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now back. Welcome back. So, Nelson, go ahead and pull control over to your screen and let us see what's been submitted. Ashley said sorry about Already. the 10 resubmits. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, da, 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 da. Something. Uh. <sighs> All right, you can see my yes. screen? No, yes, I'm just kidding. All righty, so let's go ahead and... This. Sorry, I had Buzz not open on my um my desktop. Ah, uh, gotcha. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, I just booted myself off my. Awesome. Oh, just do Buzz not. Hate this program. <laughs> <laughs> I love that he hates his own program. <laughs> okay, so let's let's take a look. Jonathan already knows um, right off the bat. Now, remember the, um, the, the spacing. What we're looking for was info about me, looking. then a new line, and then we're looking for tabbing over for both name and age. Terry. I'll, I'll let, you didn't tab over? Uh, yep, we're missing some tabs. Yep, we're missing some tabs on that. Uh, so this is what we're looking for right there. Um, Wait. And yeah, slow down, Nelson. Go back to the one we're looking for, so people can see. Yeah, Terry, we'll we'll get down to resubmits. I don't I don't think Nelson was around when we were talking about you guys resubmitting. Oh, did I? Here. And I have no idea how you're going to submit yours, Nina. She she just handed it to me. <laughs> <laughs> just pretend that's not there because I don't know where. Yeah. I'm at. I'm a handwriting is terrible. Can you read it? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we're looking for. Nice yes! job. Awesome, awesome. Alrighty, um, action is missing a return. Yeah. What? What? Oh, well, all right. Let's oh, let's oh, mention that because crazy. <laughs> you went crazy. I've never heard let's, that. No, let's let's go that. ahead and mention why you made that noise, real quick. Uh, honestly, we will accept this style of formatting. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we're not going to accept this style of formatting. Uh, this is what you might consider a programming holy war. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I personally only use this style of formatting in PHP and JavaScript. Um, I don't use this style of formatting in other languages. And what I mean by this style of formatting is I mean the curly braces up here on the on the method definition. That being said, we're not going to fail you if you use, use this style of formatting as long as you use this style of formatting correctly, right. which in this case it is. So, I mean, if you want to do it this way, that's totally fine. Just note that I am on the other side of this particular holy war myself. Um, this uh, Tokyo 
you're missing a space right there. You need a space after uh, the word return. Also, that's print GF. You want print F. And maybe he's just saying it with flair. Come on, freaking dig. We're gonna freaking dig. Come on, man. Have some fun, Nelson. <gasps> Wait a minute. Wait, did I go back up to to Mr. Tokyo? Where is our preprocessor directive to include the standard I/O header? Continue. Oh yes, you're gonna want that too. So let me see. That's good. This one's missing tabs. Um, this one is good. Good. Uh, missing tabs. Oh, well, actually, this one, they some of them might not be missing tabs, actually, because they're up here. See, I didn't notice that because I would typically consider or have the tabs start over here. Hi, at the left which hand. just goes against what you just said. But, but wait a minute, Nelly. What were you talking about? It making it confusing and now name no longer lines up with info. Uh, that is uh, <laughs> an exception to the rule. Yeah, I, 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 what was that thing that I said in that? Um, uh, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote myself okay. real fast. Oh, do you remember that loading ready run? Where oh, come you, on, stay focused, stay focused, stay focused, stay focused. No, no, no I'm, 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 this is focused. Uh, I am gonna quote myself though. Um, I did it in the member sponsor lounge somewhere. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. I did, uh, so this is something I did say that does relate, this particular discussion that I'm quoting from doesn't relate specifically to uh, tabs and new lines, but this is an overall um, sort of disclaimer to anything that I might say. Um, and that is, um, uh, so I'm quoting myself here. I will not lie to students when they get asked point blank questions. One of the hardest things teaching programming is getting asked why about everything from code formatting to language choice to when you'd use one language construct over another. The biggest issue with teaching programming is that after years of developing software, you've grown intuition about how things should be structured without without necessarily re realizing why it is you do things a certain way. Answering these questions without either sounding like an idiot or incredibly biased is sometimes impossible. So that's why I sounded like an idiot earlier. I, I didn't say you sounded like an idiot. <laughs> but, well, okay, okay. But anyway, so I just wanted to, to point that out um, really quickly. So in this case, I would put the tabs here. I prefer the tabs to be here because that then lines up with this. And if you think about it, the, the whole name doesn't line up with info bit, that's irrelevant because the name isn't going to line up with info because the name is tabbed over. Right. Um, oh, 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 let's talk about formatting here. Here. Yeah. Um, this I would consider poor formatting. Um, I would prefer to see these uh, tabbed over. Um, tabbed or spaced over. Per Preferably tabs, but then again, tabs versus spaces. Another programming holy war. Um, I would prefer to see tabs or spaces here indenting these statements, um, delineating them into the main function. I totally agree, by the way, with, yeah, no return. And I totally agree with what Jonathan said over in BuzzNet. And that is basically you format using your slash n and slash t the same way you format your Word documents. You get to the end of a line that you're typing, you hit enter. That's kind of mm -hmm. how I was thinking. It's intuitive. Then you to... want to tab over. You tab. Then you start writing. Oh, it's all good. It's all good, Chris. All right. So. Okay. Um. Good. Um. Tabs at the end. Again, I, I, I'm so, I'm so sorry to people who you know might have latched onto what I said earlier about the the control statements should be on the uh, the other line, but I mean stuff and things. Mm -hmm. Um. Good. <laughs> now, I did say earlier that I would accept single line programs, although this technically isn't a single line program, program so there. Um, I'd probably prefer this to be broken out into multiple. Of contexts. course, because that's uh, even harder to read, but he's sticking his tongue out at you in BuzzNet, so it's all good. Continue. <laughs> Ooh, we're missing some semis. Termin Termin now, keep in mind, when I say semi, I mean Terminator. Um, I just want to qualify this real fast. If I say paren, I mean parenthesis. When I say curly, I mean curly brace. And when I say semi, I mean semicolons or terminators. 
And so this program wouldn't compile. And, and you'd also gone. probably And the return's missing. Want the return. But yeah. Nina's all over this now. Uh that's good. Um yeah. And Saturn, I, I already know you resubmitted this correctly, but as you see right here, we can tell with the syntax highlighting that you missed a um a double quote. But we already I already saw that you resubmitted. And a terminator. And a terminator. Very good, Nina. And a return. Yeah. Um blah 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 blah. Oh, da, 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 da. oh so many submissions. Awesome. Oh um there's Saturn again, but I already saw oh. that you uh, resubmitted. Um, look at wait, look at look wait, look at Matthew good. go with all the look at all the comments and this is what he's expecting it to you know be sending out and that's an overachiever and I like it. He's, that's just sexy. I like it. Ooh, but you didn't gather he didn't gather his requirements correctly um, because in his uh, requirements up here um, he doesn't have the colons aligned. Poop. The colons aligned? I didn't have colons aligned. What are you talking about? No, nope. oh. nope. He had the first. I just letters. wanted. Oh. I just wanted. Why didn't you? Colin should. I just be wanted there. the uh, quotes oh. aligned. <laughs> well, never mind. Then fine. He, that he was... gathered the requirements correctly. Yes. The, the requirements were just dumb. <laughs> Whatever. Oh. <laughs> um, oh, that was the other one. Yeah, jump through resubmission. Wow. Momo, my. This. It's very spacey. A lot of, a lot of, um, very artistic. <laughs> very um, artistic. I would probably, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll... Well, actually, oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, then yeah. we're missing, we're missing all of the escape characters for the, uh, the tabs, yeah. escape sequences. And, right. and the double. Um, in this particular case, um, it looks like you indented twice. I would prefer to see that just indented once. Um, maybe you didn't, I don't know, but that my, the viewer that I have does some processing on indentation. Um, so there's Saturn without a return type or an include, um, but with the appropriate stuff, things, without the quotes. Um, <laughs> clicked on it again, bro. <laughs> I think this is from, I think this is from earlier. My, my, I think my stuff got oh, confused. Okay. Um, <laughs> and of course, there we go, our single line program. And again, I have to, you know, eat my words and say I'll accept that. Okay, so yeah, looks good. Okay, um, so real quick, Nelson, um, bring up Xcode and do it. There, well, I, I, I want people to see it now. That oh, do yes, it because it, it'll only take a couple minutes. There were a handful of people that were still off, and I. This will give Nelson a chance to actually do a little bit of typing and explain uh, the characters. For again, there there were people that that missed it, and just Nelson going over saying good, bad, good, bad doesn't really help. I know very very um, verbose class. I want it to be that way. Blah blah. blah. Okay, so um, obviously we would start off with the include stdio dot h. Then we would do in main, and I'm not that used to uh, Xcode, unfortunately. Um, then we're going to go ahead and print f, and I already forgot the specification. Um, so say info about me, colon. Now the two next lines are going to be name and age, and they're going to be tabbed over. Now, now stop and explain. Make sure you explain. Okay. In this particular case, I am starting with a uh, tab to indicate that I want, or, or tab escape sequence, that slash Correct. T, um, indicating that I want the, um, the console to emit a tab sequence, which will bring name indented over a little bit. Uh, then I have the colon. Um, I'm going to put in another tab here. Then I'm going to bring in a, a double quote. Now notice how I have to escape the double quote with the backslash. And the reason that is, is because what this whole thing is, it's called a string literal. And a string literal is delineated by double quotes. So how do we tell the C compiler if we want to print out a literal double quote or if we want to end the string literal? 
And in this case, we tell it that we want it to print out a double quote literally by escaping it with a backslash. So in this case, I printed out my name, I added another literal double quote, then I added a new line character. Another thing I did, um, if you guys didn't notice, I hit Command S. Um, save often, save very, 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 very often. In fact, I would recommend saving at the end of every single file. So get very used to hitting Command S and learning how to type on a different keyboard. Mm -hmm. Um, so then age, and then I want to just, I'm going to go ahead and this is another um, handy little thing, uh, a little tip for people. So notice how, how I type this out. I started off with print F and then I, I did start off with the T age colon, but then I added the, the two escapes and then the end double quote. And that was just to make it a little bit easier for me to find where I should um, put that in. Let me go ahead and correct that mistake right there with that tab. But the problem is, is adding in literal double quotes is, um, it's, it's not that it's non-obvious or particularly difficult, but it can get very confusing. So if I'm printing out a string with a lot of uh, literal double quotes in it, I find it's easier to get the double quotes in place first, make sure the entire line is valid, and then fill in the data that I want. Now I would know whether or not this line is valid by looking at the syntax highlighting. Notice how if I knock off this last um, double quote, we now not only have an error being printed out by Xcode, but we also have our uh, paren and semi be highlighted the same way that uh, Xcode highlights string literals. So in this particular case, we know that we probably are missing a end double quote. So make sure that the line is valid and then fill in the stuff in here. And then I'm going to go ahead and toss in a new line. And I believe that was, this is to spec. Go ahead and, yeah, go ahead and build run. So in this case, I hit uh, command R. And now notice how, oh yeah. Yeah, it comes up automatically. So that's, that's what I was looking for right there. Now, Jen had asked if you could show uh, what you were complaining about, about the colon should always be aligned. I, whenever I print out um, uh, applications that are very data centric, um, I typically like to put the, sl the tab before the colon, so the colons are aligned, then I like putting a space afterwards. This is just a preference. I think that's um, not easier to read because I need to add some spaces over here. Um, I think this is easier to read than the um, than the alternative, personally. But why'd you have to put spaces I mean, over there? Well, the reason, it's because of the nature of how tabs work. See, a tab um, will, so if I go ahead and put in some dots and then go ahead and do this. Now, if I hit tab, a tab's going to appear here and here and here and here. So now if I hit a um, tab, notice how it jumps over there. And then B tab, notice how it jumps over there. Then C tab, notice how it jumps over there. So these are tab characters, but the width of the tab character is determined by what are called tab stops. So if I look at this line, notice how there's a tab stop right here, a tab stop right here, a tab stop right here, and a tab stop right here, and a tab stop right here. Because age has fewer letters in it than name, um, it the tab stop immediately after the E didn't align with the tab stop immediately after the E of name. So I had to add a few spaces. I probably only needed to add one space to get it to align to the correct tab stop. And as you see right there, that's the case. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I'm just asking questions for other people. Okay, so basically, all we've got here is a simple exercise in formatting, and for those of you that truly are new to programming, your first opportunity to work with formatting a string of characters using escape sequences. They're not bad. You just you have to think about it. That's the key thing. All right, Nelson, thank you very much, sir. And I'm going to bring us back over to my Mac real quick. Mac. You guys should now be seeing blue. Okay, so now what I'd like for us to do 
is move into the wonderful world of variables. At this point, the only thing we've seen is that we can go in there and we can call upon functions to do or perform some sort of functionality. And we've used printf for doing that. But when working with uh, the development of an application, you're going to find yourself needing to store data all the time. Nelson, would you like to add a little bit in on that? I mean, because I mean, data is obviously very important, back to what you were saying much earlier tonight in regards to what a program is. Right. I mean, a program is, at the end of the day, I like to think of a program as a, um, a list of instructions that's responsible for acquiring data, whether that data was passed into the program or acquired from user input, processing the data, and then outputting data. But in order to acquire data, you need to have somewhere to store the data while the program is running. And then in order to be able to manipulate that data, you also need to be able to store that data somewhere. And to output data, you obviously need to be able to store that data somewhere. So a variable uh, is a way to hold data that you're, you either collected from the user or data that you are in the process of performing actions against. So if you if if any, everybody should be familiar with um, what RAM is on your computer, RAM is used to store variables. That's the very most absolute basic definition of that component of your computer. The more RAM you have, the more scratch space or um, work area that your programs have in order to compute values. Did that make sense? Yeah. Uh, two things real quick. Jonathan asked a question, an interesting one. Are tab stops sized differently across different operating systems? Um, I believe uh, that what determines the tab stop is dependent on the program itself. I don't believe there's like, a standard. Like how we like did for, it inside of Xcode. Right, um, because in, um, in Notepad, for example, tab stops are placed eight spaces across instead of four spaces across. And then, real quick, Chris asked about um, his project when creating his project, and I just want to address that real quick. He was wondering how that we got, you know, main.c, where when he saw his project, he had appdelegate.h and appdelegate.m. Uh, Chris, you need to make sure that you create a uh, command line tool. So it needs to be a command line tool. And then you need to make sure that you say that it's going to be a C program when you can specify what language. So that one's important. And then Jonathan said, so the answer is yes about the tabs. If Windows console spaces differently than um, OS X's console. Nelson. Oh, um, if Windows console, you, you know, I, I believe Windows consoles use four spaces for tabs, and I believe the OS X terminal uses four spaces for tabs. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, sweet. Back to me. All right, thank you very much, Nelson. So, <laughs> variables. We need to store information. Again, please forgive me as I now downshift and start, you know, food or, uh, yeah, spoon feeding spoon you. Food. I was working on it. I wanted to say baby spoon feeding, but that's like, no. Nah. But yeah, basically, so a variable. We need to be able to hold information that we can then work on. Like if we wanted to ask a user what their name is or what their age is and, and do something with it. Uh, so with a variable, uh, the way I generally like starting out with ex explaining it to, uh, to people is with boxes. So as Nelson said, variables are places in memory that are set up to hold information. So information is going to be stored there. And I like to represent this as a box, as a container. Now, a variable has a name. Now, in memory itself, real memory, it doesn't come down to names. It comes down to just memory addresses where a piece of data resides. But us, the programmers, when we're writing code, we're not going to be dealing with these addresses. Well, kind of a little bit later when we start talking about pointers and all, but we're going to be working with what's known as identifiers, uh, friendly names for our variables. So if I wanted to create, well, let's, let's go back to, um, let's just start real simple. Let's say I wanted to make a variable and I wanted to call it X. So this is an identifier. Ooh. Go ahead. 
I do really just re really quickly want to point out, um, if you are familiar with uh, with math, um, variables and programming bear resemblance, but are uh, variables in C, I should say, bear resemblance to variables in mathematics, but they're different in that they can change. I just really want to quickly point that out in case people who are familiar with math are thinking, oh, variable, you know, that's something that that's a value that could be anything, but can't change because it can't change in math. Um, in programming, variables change. Correct. I just wanted to point Which, that out well, quickly because that could be confusing. Gotcha, but we're, but we're going to look at that very carefully here in just a minute. Now, in creating a variable, what we need to do is we need to basically tell the compiler that, hey, we need a variable, and this is going to be the name that we're going to use in our code to refer to the variable to the memory location that you're going to set up for us. But we also need... Oh, Jen, yeah, I think mine's hung as well. But we also need to know what type of data is going to be held in that location in memory. So I'm just going to come in here and put type. And there are a handful of types uh, that are provided to us through the reserved keywords for the C language, as we saw earlier when we were talking about int, and there's float, and there's a char or car, depending on what side of the fence you're on in the programming world. But, um, you know, there, there's a handful of basic ones that are available, and then we can go in there and start defining our own, like with, with structs, making our own combinations of, of uh, different types to make a larger type, if you will. But let's start real simple. So let's say that I wanted to hold a number, a whole number. We all saw earlier tonight that whole numbers are represented with ints. So if I wanted to store like the number three, then I know that this type that I'm going to need is going to be an int. So I need to declare to the processor, or excuse me, to the compiler, that I'm going to need a variable that is going to hold an integer value and I need to tell it what the identifier is going to be so that then as I continue working forward in code with my statements, I can now work with that memory location but with just a friendly username because I have no idea what the actual memory address is going to be ahead of time. It's whatever the operating system when the program launches, it's whatever uh, memory area gets put in and what memory gets assigned at that moment. So to declare, this is very, very important. Variables must be declared before you can use them. So in this particular case, int space x terminator. That's it. In declaring, as you can see here, you must specify type. And you must specify your identifier. Okay. Now... At this point, we have a variable that would be declared to the compiler, but it's not being used. We haven't actually put anything in it. So if I was to bring our attention back up here to my box, what is currently... See, now I can start talking English. I can say, what's currently in X? What's in X right now? Nothing. Nothing, but here's a yeah. As I say, but here's a different way to look at it. We haven't put anything in there, and the uh, the program just basically gave. We just got a, a a bit of memory given to us that we can use to put information in there, and that memory is a given size based on the type. But it didn't go in there and clear out what was actually in that memory location. Now some compilers will. I do want to throw that out there but you you and and some will not so you simply have to go by it's we don't know what's in that value in, in that actual memory location right now so something it's like uh, someone passed you a used notebook and whatever's on the top of that used notebook that was used last is what you get exactly so right now we don't know what's in there it's a it's a big question mark so we haven't uh, it's generally referred to as initializing. We haven't initialized this variable yet. So if we now proceed forward and start using it, um, we can get ourselves in trouble, especially 
when we get into a scenario where we're using pointers and we start slinging around actual addresses of where that data is being stored. Now, because we, well, we can get into all sorts of trouble quickly. Typically, you crash your program. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean, serious trouble. So um, I do want to point out real quick, and I need to do this myself. Uh, Jen did point out over in the webinar that BuzzNet did seem to hang, and it has hung for me as well. And if you just refresh your screen, if you haven't seen anything new come in in a while, just refresh it. Which I'm, I'm doing the same right now just so that I can jump back into class and see uh, active conversation that's going on. There we go. So, so you don't need to specify a size constraint. Okay, so this is something that Nelson's in the middle of talking about. Right now, as far as size goes with memory, uh, with these, these basic types that we're using, uh, the compiler is going to know how much space an integer is going to need to reserve in memory for you to store data there. Right. And go ahead. And that's language specific. That's correct. And there's a way that we can actually take a look at how many bytes each or each of our basic types are going to hold here shortly. And what did I do with my pen? There it is. Need my Wacom tablet. So at this point, once again, all I have done is declared. I, I really want to make sure those of you that are new to working with code understand the the terminology that's going on here. I have declared a variable. I've told the compiler I'm going to need a variable, so set it up for me, and I want to be able to refer to that place in memory as X. Now I need to initialize it. So I'm going to drop down to the next line, so pretend this is the next line of code, and I can say X equals 15, terminator. And when this line executes, this statement is going to actually have 15 put into X. So again, X is representing some memory location, somewhere out in memory, this area right here. And we just stored 15 in it that we can turn back around and work with if we wanted to. Yeah, and it's not like you're not saying X is 15. You're saying put 15 into X. Okay. Again, a difference between mathematics and program. It's, it's an assignment. It's not a declaration of truth. It's an assignment. Okay. Let's talk about our first operator. This is called an assignment operator. All right. Okay. So a single equals is an assignment. So a little bit later on when we start looking at if statements and you're going to want to say if x is equal to 15, equals is an assignment operator. It's not an equality check. That's going to be equals equals. So equals is simply an assignment. Now what's on the right side of equals? This is referred to as an expression. Now granted, this is a very literal expression. It's, the expression is just 15. It is a literal expression. That, that's why I said it. it's very I, literal. It's no, it's literally a literal. <laughs> it's literally literal. I, I know. I'm, uh, Nelson doesn't. No, you're growling. Nelson doesn't understand the way I teach. But okay, so we have an expression there. But something else that would have been valid. What if I would have? Let's say that line executes, and then I I have another line. So this will be the third line in our little program. What if I did x equals x plus five? See output to that complete beginners go. Do what now? Our complete beginners over in BuzzNet. What what what'll be an X after this line executes? If we execute that line, then this line, and then finally this line. Wait. And Jen says twenty. Does everybody agree? Okay, five. Twenty. I think twenty. Five. five. And um, no, 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 Nina, no, no. Nina thinks five. No, twenty. Twenty. Nina's on the fence. Okay. If you're, wait a minute, she's, she's really on the fence, guys. She's bobbling. So we've assigned it. Okay, so we've, we've assigned it. So on the second line, in this line of execution, 15 is put into X. So now, let's take a look at our third line. Again, what is this as a group? Oops. What is that called? An expression. An expression. That's right. So this, this expression is not a literal 
It's not just 15. Now we actually have something going on. We're using another operator. We're use, using an addition operator to add these together. But this is how it works. If, if you said five, um, do, not, uh, do not feel bad. So then it is 20. It is, it is 20. Um, but I've, I've had so many people over the years that are new to working with variables uh, get a little confused here simply saying that, oh, okay, well, then this is just going to be five is going to end up getting put in there. But what's actually happening here is the expression is going to be evaluated before the assignment operator takes place. This is very, very important to understand. So, again, right side, this is evaluated first. So let's take a look. Let's evaluate it. Well, what is X? X is a memory location that's holding something in it. What is it currently holding in it? 15. Why is it holding 15? Because I told it to, right? All right. Now we're saying, well, take whatever's in X. Remember, it's identifier. It is a friendly way of simply saying that memory location, which is holding 15. And, and then we say, take that number and add 5 to it. So this expression, and let me go ahead and push this up. So this expression evaluates to what? 20. 20. But it's not done. The line now looks like this. If we, if we want to just work our way through simplification, x equals 20. That's what happens after x plus 5 is evaluated, once the expression has been evaluated. So now what is this? Oh, heavens, what is this operator again, Nina? An assignment An operator. An assignment operator. That's right. So what are we assigning? We're simply 20. assigning... 20 into x, and here's what happens. So again, back to this memory location up here. Remember, my cute little box is just sitting here. It's just, bonk, overwrites it. So we didn't reserve the data. We didn't, we didn't protect the data. We simply overwrote the data. Another little example. Oh, wow, I've already scrolled all the way down. Well, let's scroll over. Little program, int x terminator what does this line what does this line do quick oh, declare. declare very good that's right this is going to declare a variable so we now have a space set up in memory that will hold a specific amount of bytes because we told it the type very good mr tokyo drip and jen both you guys and we know that we can identify it with the identifier x So x equals x plus x, x equals x plus x. Now we're going to bring in a new operator. So this is multiplication. Yeah, some people right now are be like, man, you didn't tell me this is going to be a math class. That looks like a bunch of math. I quit. All right. This is simple math. Come on. What is X equal to at the very Look, Tokyo drips so fast, he's already got the answer. Good. Jen's got the answer. Eh, ex excellent. Excellent. You guys are just like pumping the answer out like crazy. So at the end of execution through this, again, we're going to linearly execute each line one at a time, each statement. But when we get to the end, everything before it is all irrelevant. Why? Because I just used an assignment operator and I said, look, just put 12 in X. I, I just want 12 over there. But now keep in mind. But I, I do want to. Uh, well, go ahead and say you're keeping mind because I, I do want to back back up and, and go through what's happening yeah. here because it brings in something else that's interesting too. Keep in mind, compilers will never prevent you from doing something stupid. <laughs> well, they, in some cases, they try to prevent you. They, 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 but at the, at, the, at the end of the day, you can always write code that is dumb, and it'll compile. <laughs> As we saw, Nelson wrote dumb code earlier, and he admitted it that it was dumb, and we all applauded. So, so let's pretend let, – well, let's not pretend. Let's say that we're going to execute. So at this point, let's just walk through this. What, is this, what does this line right here do? Quick, throw it over in the buzz net. You guys are too slow. Declares. Still too slow. Too, okay, good. Declares what? A? Declares Declare, a, a, a? Variable. Variable. Okay, declares a variable. Now, a statement. Ooh, we get to do something. We're going to execute this line. What happens? 
very good, Jen. We're going to, I love this, she just spot on. It is an assignment, but we're actually initializing X. Well, I mean, Jonathan, she is. It, it is an assignment. We are assigning, but it, I love the fact that Jen said we're initializing it. That had elegance to it because it's true. X now contains three. It, it is now under our control. We know what is in, in it for sure. So it's been initialized. Good job. So now we move on to, ooh, and do not get INIT stuck in your head because we're going to be using INIT when we get into Objective-C later on. And don't get INT confused. This does not mean initialize. Just in case, that may have been a joke. I'm sure it was. Okay, you're That's laughing integer, good. Right? I just want to make sure that you know that is specifying a type. Don't, don't scare me like that, man, ah. Exion. Jeez. Okay, so we know there's a three in there. Moving down to the next line. So x equals x plus x. What happens here? Nina, what happens on this line? Oh, gosh. Um, I can't think of this. No, I don't want a number. I want to know what happens. Okay, so it's, okay, so it's taking what's in there, and then it's adding. <laughs> I'm like, I'm okay, sorry. Okay, Jen, all right, Jen came to your aid. Excellent. Thank you, Jen. Jen, Jen said the key word I was looking for, expression. Basically, Oh. We're going to evaluate this. This expression requires evaluation. This was just oh, a literal. Okay. The, the, I'm pointing to the three. Go, go ahead, can, Nelson. Can I quickly say something? Um, I, I bet most of you are familiar with order of operations it's from school. Um, what's interesting about how order of operations relates to programming is pretty much every operator relates to the order of operations of the language and the assignment operator, the equals operator is incredibly low down the list of order of operations, meaning it's the one of the last things that can possibly execute. So everything, bef everything except the equals will be evaluated before the equals is evaluated, before the assignment happens. Can't believe all you guys are still hanging out with us. Everybody's still here. This is shocking. Okay. No, I'm just I'm, – I'm Is that something against my explanation? No, it was, it was beautiful, Nelson. I, I sat here and I wept. I wept glorious tears down my face as you explained it like I have never heard it before. Thank you. Okay, he so said, uh -huh. I don't know if you're being sarcastic. No, no, I, I did weep. Okay, so continuing on, as you can see right here. That's an expression. This is an expression, and like Nelson said, see, I was listening, Nelson. This assignment operator, it's way down the list. That's that's why I like saying that everything on the right of that assignment operator is going to be evaluated first. So let's evaluate this expression. What's currently in, so that means right now, don't even think about this. So if we get into the habit of just, you know, think about the box here. Think about the data that's being stored in the box, right? And then let's just use that if we want it to rewrite any line. Whoopsie. If we want it to rewrite any line in helping us evaluate, let's just replace X with what X is. So I can take this expression and just say what's in X right now? Three. Three. So I can say three plus what's in X right now? Three. That's right. It's still three. Da -da. What's this? Now, God, now we're going to do expression. some math. I'm so sorry, guys. Three plus three is? Six. Da -da. So again, we're going to do simplification. So we could say this line now looks like X equals six after the expression was evaluated. And now we can assign the result of that evaluated expression into x, because that's all that's left to be solved for. That's the only thing left to be handled is the assignment operator. So what happens? What happens to this 3 right here? It's a 6. It becomes a 6. So 6 is what's sitting there at the moment. Okay. And no, we're not talking about concatenation right now. We're not dealing with characters and strings. That's where, that's where stuff gets really fun. Um, okay. So, so far so good. Everybody making sense? Yes. Example three. Wait a minute. Jonathan. What? Jonathan said, I'm only right here, Jonathan. He just, he just woke up and looked at the screen and got it all confused. <laughs> now we're moving down to here, Mr. Jonathan. Pay attention. <laughs> and, don't, and don't be going giving the answer to everybody. Right now we've only got six. So now we're moving <laughs> down to the next line. So once again, taking a look at this, the first thing we need to do is what? Initialize. There, no. Wait, hold on. Yeah. 
You guys can do it. What are we doing? We're looking at the line. Expression. Good, Jen. Expression. Good. That's right. I want you guys to start thinking this way. Start using this terminology. Yes, there is an assignment, but we have an expression that needs to be, what's the magic word? Jen got it. Evaluate it. Good job, Jen. So we need to evaluate this. Now Jonathan gets to have a little bit of fun. But Jonathan, you be quiet for a second because this is what I was waiting to see what people would get. So what, how, how does this evaluate? So this is going to, let, let's draw this out now, just like we did a minute ago. So how am I going to draw it out? Six. Six, okay. Plus six. Plus six. Times, times two. Times two. All right, so let's figure this out. What's the result? You would think it was 24, I would imagine. All right, so I heard a 24. And then I it's see some 18s. All right. Ah, uh, pad mass. Any, anybody else? That's right, Jen. This is very important. What we want to do is we want to, our right, order of operations here. Multiplication and division, same level, done from left to right. So as far as which one goes first, it's just left to right when dealing with multiplication and division. But multiplication and division hold a higher order of precedence than addition and subtraction. Ooh. So this is written in a way that I would not have written it in an actual program because this is hard to see. But this is so important to stress because people goof this up all oh, the time. So it is 18. So multiplication is done first. All right, so 6 times 2 is? 12. 12. So let's simplify as we're working our way through evaluating this expression. So 6 times 2 is 12 plus 6. So it is 18. And then this is just, well, regular addition. So we're left with 18. So let me erase some of this. So again, if we're going to do simplification in this line right here, we end up with x equals 18. And what does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? What happens to this big, sexy place out in memory? It turns into 18. It is simply rewritten with an 18. That's right. It turns into an 18. 18 is what is being stored at that memory location right now. Now, I did say just a second ago that this isn't the way that I would have written it. And the reason is, even though that I know the order of operations that multiplication would have taken place first, I would have used parentheses. Parentheses have a very high, or they're very high mm -hmm. in the order. And this just makes it very easy to just look at and be like, boom. Okay? So be careful when you're doing some of these real simple things that we'll be asking from you guys. Make sure you keep order of operations in mind. Because um, in this case, multiplication is going to be a higher order than the plus, okay? So, moving on down, as I see Nelson's having a good time playing with people over in uh, BuzzNet with crazy stuff. <laughs> so we know at this point right here, oh goodness, I got stuff written all over the place. Again, for those of you that are advanced coders, have fun with Nelson over there. He's helping to keep you guys entertained because again, this is important for the beginners. All right, so now, we jump down to the next line, and like we already saw, 12 is simply assigned to x. Da, 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 da. The end. Simple, right? Everyone, simple, right? What we've seen so far, piece of cake. Yes. Okay, Nina's got it. I got it. Jen answered almost everything all for the me. Terms. Yes, the terminology, and, and I'm just going to continue drilling you guys on terminology. Expression. Expression, that's okay. right. Recipe analogy equals piece of cake. Oh, that's great. So, Chris, <laughs> piece of cake is now being stored in recipe uh, analogy. <laughs> that's great. Let's jump over here and take a look at this now for, uh, for real in code. Yeah. So, as a matter of fact, I'm going to come up here to this guy, and I'm going to say, fun, no, I'm not going to say foo, fun with <laughs> variables, hooray, and all that good stuff. Oh, by the way, let me ask you guys a question, and this is where some people will gasp, and I apologize if I make you gasp. If I happen to go over 
the 10 o'clock cutoff for us. Are you guys okay with it? You don't have to stay. That's not required for the certificate at the end. It's not required. I, I like to be able to share as much as I can with my students. That's important to me. So I'm, I just want to let you know that I will pro I'm looking at the time. I've got several more things I want to share. So I will probably go over. This is being recorded. You can come back and watch this video, okay? So just letting you guys know. So you don't get mad. Mandrill, for certificates, fantastic question. I'm no longer requiring attendance. The, it makes the whole new certificate process a million times easier. I'm just requiring that the homework is completed by the time it's required when the course is going on. That's all that needs to be done. Okay? So, and Jonathan, I don't, I don't, I don't, no, you can tough this out, man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You've got to go to work in five hours. All right, so let's do exactly, like I said, I want to make a variable called x, and I want it to hold an integer value. Int. Notice how it just changed colors to this purple color. Notice we've seen the purple color a few times now. We saw it up here with this int. We saw it here. We saw it with return. Remember what I was talking about? Keywords. keywords. That's right. This is a reserved keyword. This is built in. Go ahead, Nelson. <laughs> I'll, then I'll no. just. I'll say I'll, later. Do you want me to send you to the C spec? Because then you can write them and argue with them. I, I mean, it is in the spec. So let's go ahead and I'm going to come in here and say int x terminator. What does this line do? Quick, throw it over in the thing. Oh, God. Declare. It throws an Declare. error because the, your bissings, Jason, remember. Do what now? It if you try to hit control R, well. Eh. Does it declare the variable? No, what? No. Control it, command R. Maybe I'm forgetting See, I don't know. I, I build successful. What were you expecting? I know it's an unused variable because we haven't done that yet. But but uh, I must be thinking about another Yeah, because you're freaking me out because you're like suddenly. Oh, wow. Lost in translation. Yeah, Nelson, Nelson's on planet Lala. So let's ignore him for just a moment. Back to everything <laughs> that I have shown. Um, you, no, no, Jen, you guys are not scaring you. Nelson is scaring you guys and me. And I agree with Tokyo Drip. Nelson needs coffee, lots of it. As I said, ladies and gentlemen, this line here declares a variable. Now, as you can see, I just built the, uh, the program by hitting Command-R, and look what I get over on the side. I get this little warning. It's just like, hey, dude, I'm letting you know you've got an unused variable with the identifier of X. You, you really want to try to avoid having warnings, and especially errors, obviously, because errors, well, they're going to end up with your program not working. So, um, yeah, this is slow down and prepare to stop. I, I like that. Yes, this is, this is just a warning. It's letting you know, hey, caution here. So now what we need to do is we need to put something in it. And we've already seen how to do this. X equals 25, Terminator. Now I'm going to hit Command R and blow Nelson's mind. Nelson, there are no warnings and no errors. Are you, are, you okay, are, yeah. are you okay with that, or do you need to contact somebody of higher authority and set them straight? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm just out. I, I, I'm, I'm fine. Because I know you're Googling right now. I'll get back to you. I know you're Googling. I'll get back to you. Okay, doke. So this exactly what we're looking for right now. So let's go ahead and make another variable. Now, here's an interesting thing. It, the variable has to be declared before you can use it. I mean, that you would think just common sense stuff, but I mean, it has to be. So I can't just say y equals 12 and then come down here and say int y. No, it's going to be the other way around. It, it, how, how, how's the compiler going to know? So if I go to build this, build failed. Use of undeclared identifier, gee whiz. We work from top down. So code that's further down, if we're relying on something, it needs to already be defined. So in this case here, I need to make sure if I command X, command V, ah, look at that. How happy is this guy now? Very happy, uh, except uh, I did not mean to do that. So let me go ahead and... What? That was weird. Close. 
close. Thank you. And let's do this again. So let's go ahead and paste this in. Oh, there you go. Thank you. So now we're making two variable declarations, X and Y. And we are initializing both. And if we were to come in here right now and do a command R to run this, we have get build succeeded and fun with variables written out. So now what I want to do is do something with this so that we can see that what's actually happening with these variables. So I'm going to say x equals 2. And then I'm going to say y equals x plus, what is it, Nelson? Can I redeem myself real fast? What is that? The Microsoft C compiler follows the C specification and disallows declaring variables anywhere but the top of the function. That's what I was groaning at earlier, and I just verified it on my uh, Visual uh, Studio 2012. Compiling C code does not allow you to declare a variable anywhere but the top of the function. Okay. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's sta that's standard C code. That's no, what I was okay, no, that, about. that I guess. I, okay. So continuing on, here here we go. I, I and, and let's let's do this just to stay compliant. Wait. He what what he's getting at is we actually have a statement, and, and it is this is something that you will yeah, and it compiles and work, works just fine. But um, again, if we want to and and we do, we want to stay as compliant as we possibly can with uh, with all of the compilers. And so our variables are at the top. Again, back to if we're going to be using something like a variable, it needs to be declared. And here, we, you know, we need to make sure that all of these declarations are at the top of a function, okay? So, and, and MMO, MMO does says, yay, now it's in OCD order. Very nice. Okay, but anyways, so moving on. So, uh, I didn't, I didn't. I really didn't mean to throw you off, but I, like you said, I just wanted to make sure if anybody is following along with uh, Microsoft C compiler. No, yeah, no, that's that's totally cool. That I I'm good with. I thought you were meaning something completely different when I said keyword, and you were like, ah, and I, I didn't know okay. what you were getting at. Okay, so now let's go ahead and say y equals 32. So we've done a few different things with what is in X and what is in Y, but we're not showing anything in the console. So what I want us to do, this is gonna be our first taste of using the debugger, is I, I want to show you, is this so simple? I wanna show you how we can go through and we can watch what's happening. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do two things. And right now, again, I'm just looking for people to be watching, those of you that really are new. And you can and be taking notes, and then I am more than happy when you guys go to do this, um, pausing video and helping anybody who has any questions whatsoever and going back over it. All I did was clicked over here in the gutter. And what this does is it activates a breakpoint for me. Okay? I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to switch this window from auto over to local variables. So I can see everything that's going on in here. And what I want you to watch is what happens when I hit run now. So when I'm running my program, execution, the application was built, execution started, but we've now temporarily halted execution on this line right here. And this is going to allow me to show you some really cool stuff. Let's take a look at what is currently inside of X and Y. Oh my goodness, it does not contain a zero, does it? X actually had something in it, didn't it? Y had something in it. Th that's not good. This is what I mean by once you declare a variable, you need to initialize. You've got to initialize the variable. So right now, here I am. I haven't executed line 13. That's going to be the next line that executes. But we're now able to watch in memory what's happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to step through. I'm going to execute that line Take a look at X now in memory. Again, this is what's really in memory. It now contains the integer value 25. I did not say dink, Exion. <laughs> so we now have 25 in there. We're waiting for execution here on line 14. So we haven't put 12 in Y yet, but as soon as I execute that line, you can see 12 was just placed inside of Y. 
Execution now jumps down here to this next one. So what's going to happen on line 17 when we execute it? Quick, 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 people, quick. X is going to turn into two. That's right. What is currently being, very good, Dementis, what's currently being stored in X, which is 25, is going to be replaced with, two. with the value 2. And let's check. Dink. Hey, look at that. Now the next thing, we're ready to execute An y expression. equals x plus y. So we've got this expression, very good, over here on the right-hand side. So what is in x? Well, let's look down here, a 2. two. What is currently in y? A 12. 12. If we add those two together, Tokyo drips all over it, 14. 14. We have a winner, that's right. So let us go ahead and execute that line. And oh goodness, we actually have a 14 now being stored in y. Now, we're ready to execute line 20. We have a literal expression, just the number 32. What's going to happen? It's going to change y to 32. It's simply going to be replaced. Okay, so let's go ahead and verify that's true. Bink. And as you can see with the ending of this program here, we are now left with x with a 2 and y with a 32. Nelson. Think. Yo, you have anything that you want to say? I thought it sounded like you were going to, you took a deep breath like you were going to say something. No. Um, Someone was asking what LLDB is. Um, that's just the debugger program. Yes, the, much, the one that makes me much happier now because I like the output so much better. But, but that's just me. Any, anyways, uh, and that was changed a, uh, a little while back. Actually, no, wasn't that in 4.5, I think, is when that actually became available. But anyways... So much cleaner looking, in my opinion. So there we go. We just walked through an application used, using what is called the debugger that allowed us to put a breakpoint in, which allowed us to halt our execution so that we could then go through line by line and watch what's happening with the values down here. And yes, you can hover your mouse over, over variables and things like that. I'm, this isn't a, a big lesson on the debugger. That's why I wanted to just show the locals for this function and let you guys watch what, what's going on with everything without having to try to follow my mouse moving all around. Just makes it a little bit easier. Nelson, what were you about to add in? Yeah. Just the, I'm just going to stress the importance of what the debugger is. It's an uh, invaluable tool for understanding what your program is doing, and it'll be something that we use as a, as a way to teach many things. So don't be scared of the debugger. That's right. Don't be scared. Now, I saw a question asked a little bit earlier that I did not answer at the time because I knew that it was coming up. Um, and that is, all right, well, how do we take what's in one of these variables and write it out to the console down here? And this is, remember, we're using printf. It's a print formatter. Okay? We can format text that we're sending out. So let's do that. Let's take a look at how we would go about saying, let, let's print out what is in X and what is in um, Y, just so that you guys have actually seen how to do this. And I'm going to come up here and just click on this. This will just, it'll leave my breakpoints in place, but it'll just temporarily disable any and all breakpoints that I have. So now what I'm going to do is type in printf. And I'm only going to, now I'm going to start using a little bit of the old code completion. Again, one of the lovely things about having an IDE, we've got code completion. As you begin typing, it analyzes what you're typing, and it's trying to help you out. And in this case, typing P and R, the only thing it understands at this point is printf. So if I want, I can just hit tab. Bink, look at that. I didn't have to type the rest of out. Hooray. So it jumped me over inside the parentheses, and now I'm ready to come in here, and, and I want to say X equals and I, I needed to say what is currently in X. And I wanted to say Y equals and whatever is currently in Y. And I'm going to go ahead and terminate this statement right here. So now let's jump back over here. And how do we get what's in X? I mean, obviously, I can't do that. That's, that's, that's a literal character. In, in this in a string, uh, that would actually just print out x equals x and y equals question mark, question mark. Doesn't work. What we can use is a thing called format specifiers with our print format function here. And the format specifier that we're going to look at first is going to be a percent D or 
percent I. They they both work, but percent D is like what I've always used. So we use a percent D, and that means that we're going to have a whole number that's going to be placed right here. But how does it know how to place it? Well, bear with me. Let's jump over here. What do you think I'm going to put here? Percent D. I, I got a, another number that I want to place there. And I know this is an integer number, so I'm formatting it to an integer. Now watch this. Now we're going to change up how we are sending our arguments in to print F. We've been just sending one argument. Were you going to say something, Nelson? No, just let me, let me know there's a few slightly ad more advanced things, but I do want to point out but later after okay. you're done with Okay, yeah, I'm, I don't want to, it's nice and slow to begin with. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here and put a comma, and when you're, when you're sending an argument list off to a function, all of the arguments are separated by commas. So now I just need to send in x, comma, and send in y. Now let's go ahead and command R. Take a look at the bottom, and we've got x equals 2 and y equals 32. So real quick, back over to the whiteboard. Again, with, with our complete beginners, I like for people to, to see this. I think it's important. So by coming in and saying print formatter, so we're calling the printf function. And then now we're going to send our arguments. So in quotes, x equals, and then I use this format specifier, percent %d. And I just, I'm still inside my double quote. So I'm still just typing this out like it's just a regular string. So now I can say and y equals another percent %d. And then in the quotes, put a comma, x, comma, y. Now remember, let's, let's all stipulate that x and y have been declared and initialized here. And now we're going to end off our argument list with a horrible looking parentheses. Terminator. And a terminator. Very good. So what happens is, again, special, special characters. These are slots that are going to be replaced. And what does it literally mean again? Yeah. Go ahead, Nelson. I, I just want to point out that this syntax with the percent, this is specific to the printf function and other similar functions. This is not a language feature of C, so you won't be able to do this with other things. Right. I just wanted to point that out. That this, it's not like an escape sequence, which is a, a, a feature of C itself. The percent %d is something that printf understands. Right. This is a format specifier that is part of the print format function. And so here we are, we're using print with formatting abilities. Well, now we're using those abilities. We're using what's called format specifiers. And so the way this works is it just, it lines up. It's really simple. If you say that I'm going to, I'm expecting to format two things, in this case, two things to whole numbers, you better feed in two arguments to fill it. The first argument goes into the first one. The second argument goes into the second one. That's what I wanted you to see was that right there. So I could have said x is percent %d and y is percent %d and z is percent %d and just gone on and on and put as long as I make sure that however many of these format specifiers I use, I have actual data that I'm going to be putting into those locations. I've used two. I've got two variables right here that are containing data that will go into those, okay? You need to have the object declared. This, uh, you're not talking to me because this isn't an object. Format <laughs> a format specifier is, yeah, this percent %d is a format specifier. And, and there's a, a few different ones that we'll see. Like if we were dealing with characters, we've got percent %c, if we're dealing with floats with decimals, you know, percent %f, if we're dealing with like a double, um, our, our long floats, like percent %lf. So there are different specifiers, percent %s for string, um, but right now we're just looking at percent %d.
Or again, you can you can use percent i as well if if that helps you because you know it's an integer whole can I ask value. Ask the newbie question: Why why is percent d or percent i okay? That it's just that's, that's just how they, they, yeah that's the way printf okay. works. They so both work. Interchangeable. Yep. Okay. So let's go ahead, Nelson. Now you said you had something a little more technical that you wanted to explain. This is only useful for people who are familiar with other languages, but I just want to point out that some people are very new to C, but have had some experience working with more scripting languages or higher level languages where you can literally construct text out of using like a plus operator or a dot operator mm -hmm. or something like that. I just wanted to point out that that is impossible in C. If you want to combine a bunch of text together, you have to use something like printf or sprintf or th that family of functions. There's no built-in way to construct a string outside of this. So if you're familiar with being able to construct strings in a different way, I just want to point out that this is the only way that you have to do it within C. Don't go looking for a way to concatenate different things because that doesn't exist. Concatenate to a pin to the end. But don't, I only say that because Nina kind of freaked out when Nelson threw that word out there. Word. That's a big fancy word. I, I, <laughs> I especially wanted to point that out because I know that there's someone who's familiar with PHP in the class, or at least partially familiar with it, and if you're used to concatenating strings together, you're going to be slightly disappointed to know that and see that that doesn't exist. But I wanted to make it explicit that that doesn't exist instead of people wasting time looking at how to do it. But we, we, will, we will be playing with uh, strings, not tonight, a little bit later, but that, that gets more advanced and, and like pretty much all other applications I mean languages working with strings is a breeze and fun and now now it's yeah. now it's going to be hard it's, <laughs> it's not. not it's not fun it's at all it's a pain okay so now we've seen how we can go about actually putting some information that is being stored in variables out okay so now we can write this out to the console piece of cake right everybody yay, yay. No, no. Super Any easy. questions or anything like that? Cherry cake. Ooh, cherry cake sounds so good. Don't say that, Matthew. Oh, oh my, with all the and, food. And milk or coffee. Either would be awesome right now. Oh, <laughs> Ashley, you hush. All right, you guys stop. You're killing me. I've not had lunch or dinner. Jeez. Okay, so very, very simple variable stuff. Now, we've also got, obviously, other types of variables that are available as well. And... Um, let me think. At this point, because I'm looking over at the clock, I, I need to... Let's go ahead and take a very quick break. I want you guys to write any sort of... Here, here's a, a quick challenge, um, except for I'm going to bring this up. Write any sort of quick program that just demonstrates creating some variables and putting some information into the variables and see if you can show what was in it. Do an expression. Do an operation on them. Add them. Subtract them. Multiply them. Or try something. Just so that you've actually made some variables. And I need to grab a, a drink real quick. So also if you need to get up and take a, a quick break, this is the perfect time. And then Nelson has already flipped the uh, send code system for demonstrate creating variables and printing variables uh, to the top. So feel free to... Uh, go ahead and submit as soon as you've got something. And, and again, this is just anything demonstrating some simple usage. And I'm going to go ahead and pause the video with the correct mouse button. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So we have resumed. Let's go ahead and switch over now to Nelson's screen. Yeah. Uh... Oh, no. Mandrel's kitchen just all oh, flooded. The kitchen flooded? Yeah, we're just oh, now no. just now coming off break. Ooh. Was it a dishwasher explosion? That function returned an error and water went everywhere. Gee. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you mess up with the <laughs> And I'm not yeah, even kidding. Just, Your kitchen yeah, will it just explodes. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and see is not let's go ahead and take a look at some of these submissions, some quick feedback. You see my Photoshop screen? I see Photoshop screen, right? screen, I do. That's all you see? Yes, sir. Blue screen Alrighty. Photoshop. Sorry. Okay, let's jump on over into view code. And oh, a whole lot less people are starting to get involved. Oh, man. Okay, let's see what we got. Oh, come on. 
I'm they're they're there. still all hanging out, but nobody wanted to type anything. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Mr. Fancy um, Pants. Mr. Fancy Pants. <laughs> Ooh, nice variable names. Um. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> Extra credit for you, man. <laughs> oh, sweet Lord, I love it. Uh, if, if anybody wants Suck to it. get extra credit, that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, yeah. That's how you do it. That's beautiful. <laughs> All right. Well um. <laughs> da, 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 da. Good. Fun in quotes. So you're saying this isn't fun? <laughs> it goes back to load ready run with the one where they put everything in quotes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. That was brilliant. Yeah, it was. I loved it. Uh, and I think that's, well, I, don't, I can't tell if that's trying to get back at me or not. <laughs> Uh, and then gather uh, requirements gathering again format output to prevent Nelson from going crazy <laughs> uh, see that's actually good um, when you do uh, requirements gathering in the real world you really got to make sure that your um, your client is happy and clients tend to care about things that you might not care about but you still got to make yeah them for sure uh, da, 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 da. Already, and then stupid, meaningless mathematic expressions. Yay! <laughs> but at least, at least, um, she's having real. Yeah, fun. not <laughs> fun. fun in quotations. All right, go ahead and go ahead and disable uh, submission, and thank you very much for doing that, Nelson. And and thank you guys for submitting because I love how this is now going to start building a a picture of all of our people that actually interact. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the screen back over real quick and talk about a couple more things. I'm in the Flintstone era of submissions. <laughs> Are you now? Yeah, paper. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so a couple of other things that I wanted to, to mention real quick. When working with variables, we saw that to, to make use of variables, we must first declare and then initialize. And for some of you guys that are completely new to programming, you saw a couple of interesting things as we looked through the different assignments that were turned in. So I want to go ahead and talk about these things. One, declaration and initialization can take place on the same line and Nelson, do you want to add to that? They can take place on the same line and Do you, do you, do you, so int x equals 15. Terminator. Yes. That is valid. Yes, it code. is very valid code. Do you have any problems with this, Nelson? It's it's not a field, so you shouldn't, but No, I don't I don't have any problems not with local variable initialization. Correct. Just making sure I I um I, I, you can't keep track of all the random things I have yes, problems it's with. Difficult sometimes. You have problems with a lot of stuff. So, <laughs> so what were you going to say? No, no, no. Fields I, I don't like um, putting right, initialized. That's, yeah, that's what on. I was just saying. Um, not fields. But, but local variables, I prefer to have initialized on local variables. Um, now, I do want to point one thing out. In C, now in Xcode, Xcode C compiler uh, has some extension on it that allows you to define variables anywhere. But in C, you can only declare variables at the beginning of a function. And so that means that you will be declaring variables that you are not using yet, which means you don't have a, quote, valid thing to initialize them to. I really want to stress this. In C, when you declare a variable and you do not, do not have something valid to put in it, Put zero in. That's right. Initial line. Make sure that you. That's right. Even even if at the point of declaration you don't have anything useful to put in, put something in. Right. 
And then the next thing I wanted to, to point out, so this is declaration and initialization taking place on the same line. Another thing that you guys saw when taking a look at other people's homework, and, and personally I'm not a big fan of this, but I mean it is used, and that is of the same type declaring multiple variables. So if I wanted to say int a comma b comma c terminator, this is the exact same thing as saying int a, int b, and int c. Okay, so I just wanted to throw that out there. When you when you do a bunch of them, I mean, generally they're not going to be little one-liners like this, which I'll let Nelson talk about naming in just a second because that becomes very important. Uh, a lot of you guys did a really nice job of coming up with good variable names. Uh, once you start having these long names and then you're putting them all on a single line, it just makes readability much more challenging. So I just I want to point that out. And again, I, like I said, I'm not a fan of it. I mean, you can do it. Uh, I, I like keeping all of my variable declarations on different lines. Okay. So Nelson. Take just a second, you don't even have to pull over to your screen or anything, just take a second and talk about names, identifier names. I, yeah, the first thing I want to talk about with identifier names is, um, and you might want to draw this out as I'm talking, um, valid identifier names, because I don't think we have covered that quite yet. Um, this is important. Identifier names can be of any length, but there's some rules that you have to follow. First of all, the only characters that you can have in an identifier name in C are alphanumeric characters. That's A through Z and 0 through 9 and underscores. So that's all you can have. There's one more rule that has to do with, and they can be of any case. There's one more rule that has to do with variable names. Um, you cannot start off with a number. So you may only start off with a underscore or a alpha character. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, Exxon, no, there's no at symbol in, uh, in C-sharp. Or, wow, we're not working no, we're in C-sharp, are we? Because there is an at symbol yes, in C-sharp. Um, in C. <laughs> um, so, yeah, valid names are that. So you can construct any name of any length following those rules. Now, you really want your variable names to mean something. That's incredibly important. Variable names are only used for you. The compiler and the computer and the CPU, they, they have no concept of what a variable name is. Um, there's no, it, when, when a program is compiled, there are no variable names in, within that program. Um, variable names are for your benefit only. And it's important that you have variable names that mean something to you. Not what type of data they contain. The type of data is implicit. If you have an int x, that x is an int. And there's the, don't name your int x int x, because that's dumb. Um, there's something called Hungarian notation, which popular that popularized by Microsoft, which is also dumb, where you pre they have it so you prefix your variable names with the type that the variable name is of, and I, and that's just dumb. Um, your the, the type of the variable comes along with the variable. You can always hover your mouse over the variable to see its type. Um, you want to name your variable something short but memorable, something that means something within the context of your program. So let's say you were calculating the area of a square. You might have a variable called width. It's a variable called height and a variable called area. And the width contains the width, and the height contains the height, and the area contains the computation that computes the area based off the width and the height. That is an appropriate way to name this and, and another example to and throw in, let's you say you are calculating something dealing with the, with the screen area of, of your program, and you want it to do the width and the height of the screen. Again, be descriptive. Screen width, not just width. Because when looking looking through code, right. width width of what you know, what are, exactly are you talking about? So variable naming is one of the most important things uh, to keep in mind when talking about making your code read well. And making your code read well is one of basically one of your goals as a programmer. Um, it, for people who are just starting off programming, you're going to have a difficult time sort of coming up with an intuition of okay, what 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 
what should I name this? What's like the, the upper limit of um, explicitness I should make with my names? But you will slowly grow uh, a sort of intuition about, okay, if I name it this way, six months down the line, I'll be able to remember what it is that this means. Exactly. And, and this all goes back also to Nelson's comments earlier about comments. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, if you're commenting, if you have a comment above a variable and that comment describes the variable in a way that could have just easily been the variable's name, then you're doing it wrong. You should just make the variable name describe exactly what the comment above the variable actually right. says. Um, now, keep in mind, you can go too far with this. As with any rule, you can go too far, and it's all about your best judgment. You won't have a very good judgment when you're starting off. You're starting off, you're, you're, you're basically starting off with a blank canvas, and you're filling it in with you know characters, and you, you don't really have an intuition about, okay, if I name it this way in six months, six months I'll be able to remember. But if you keep in mind now, that you should name things properly, experiment, try to figure out, try to create a good mental model about how to name things properly. And if you find yourself creating comments to describe your code, think about how you could use names instead, because that's almost always preferable. Very, very good, sir. Very good. Very important stuff. How about something else that's fun and interesting to look at? So we've seen a few things with variables, and there's a few more types that I'll let Nelson talk about in a few minutes since I've been talking for so many hours. But how about a quick look at, and again, just so we can have a little bit of fun, how to get input from a user. What if we wanted to ask a user, what's your age? Sound a little, yeah. oh, what? <laughs> what? What was that sad-sounding yay for? Just no. don't ask my age. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> No, I'm just saying it's going to be it's going to be a bit of an adventure to do this and see. I, so, don't get discouraged when you guys see some crazy this stuff. Isn't crazy stuff? Jeez, these guys are all becoming experts now. So, what I need to do is let's see. I'm just trying to think about how I want to get a little spot over here. So, what if I wanted to? What's what's a good variable name for someone's age? Oh, age, oh, maybe. That's impressive. <laughs> you guys rock. <laughs> I was waiting for someone to go, X. <laughs> good night, Tokyo Drip. Have a good one, man. Good night. Thanks for hanging out so long. Int age. Watch this. Initialized to zero years old. Okay. That's what Nelson was saying. So we've declared and initialized, so we're safe. Now what I want to do, and, and we're not going to be looking at error checking and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. I just want to show how we can simply... Ask someone, hey, what's your age, and let them type it in, and then show it back to us. And we have seen that we can, uh, that we can use what's called a print formatter. We can also use a function that's a scan formatter. So let's see how this works. So I could say that we're, basically we're going to print out, the question. what's your age? Age? That, that's my pseudocode. You like it? Good. You better. <laughs> And then we need to get that information from someone. And this is where we're going to look at a new function that has been made available to us once again because of the C standard library. And horrid, horrid function. Now what we, what we need to do is we need to tell scanf what information, what format of information we're looking for, and where it's going to be stored. The format specifier? So, the format specifier that we're going to be looking for here, we, we want a whole number. So, we, we saw that it was with percent %d. I'm so excited. Difference is, we, we use these, oh, uh, yes, we use these inside of double quotes, just like we saw with printf. Okay, so this, now we know the format of what we're looking for. Now we need to know where are we going to store the information. Where are we going to store this information? What they type in and they hit enter, where is that information? Where do we want it stored? You got it. Very good, sir. Age. So we run into an interesting problem here. I can't do this. 
<laughs> there is a reason. It's just it would take four hours to explain, which we have conveniently blocked out in a week or two. So the problem is this this local variable. This is a local variable, and we'll. This is. Go ahead, Nelson. What are you going to say? Uh, no, I was just saying. I, I love I love watching you try to explain this without explaining this. Uh, I'm going to explain just a little bit. This local <laughs> variable is it's it's all nice and private, if you will to the function that we're currently in. We've all seen that, right? We're all, in, in this whole case, the function that we've been working with is inside of main, right? Okay, so age is only usable inside of that function. So later when we start working with other functions, we start creating other functions, um, we'll start using the term local variables because those variables are only visible in that function. But I won't scan F to know to put information into age. Now, remember the, the cute little sexy drawing I did for you guys earlier? I said a program kind of looks like this. We've got a whole bunch of functions, and then um, we also have a library, and inside the library, there's a whole bunch of stuff. But in the end, just simplifying a whole bunch of functions as well, and we start out here with main. And everybody has their own little local variables, and we may call this guy and this guy. And well, here we are in main, and we're wanting to call some guy way out over here. Okay, so this we're wanting to call scanf. But in this particular case, remember how I drew the box, and I said it's a container. This is where the data is going to be stored. This is a memory location, and it has an identifier, and it's age. Guess guess where this box exists. The box is actually sitting right there. Later on, for those of you that know what's going on, later on when we get into stacks and heap, you'll and, and the heap, you'll really get a good understanding of what's happening. Well, with C, just stacks and stack frames. But right now, just think of it like that little box, age, is actually right there. You see how it's inside main? It's not over here. Over here knows nothing about it. So what we need to do is uh, and this is we need to tell scanf we need to tell it the address of <laughs> well, go ahead nelson oh you said we the word. need to tell it where this is actually at cuz remember this is this box what i tell you this box is it's a memory location come on let's all say it out loud i don't care if you've got sleeping family it's a memory location, location. that's right location. <laughs> there you go ashley Say it proudly. I love it. That's it. okay, Matthew. That's you're getting tired. <laughs> that's pretty much how Nelson just said it. So yeah, it's it is a oh, very nice Exion. I love it. It's a memory location, so it has an address. We just need to tell ScanF where that address is. Well, when I use age, you're not going to use the D. Word, when I you? use age like this, what I'm what I'm doing is I'm actually. I'm talking about the space and I'm talking about what's actually being stored in that memory location. But now I'm wanting to tell way over here, we've got Mr. Scan F. I need to tell him where he's going to send this information back to. And so what I need to, I'm not going to use the D word, but what I will do is I will put this little and sign in front of H. And what that's going to do is that, that that's actually going to take, instead of what's in age, it's just going to send the address over to ScanF saying, yo, yo, here is where you can dump your information in. And the address of that little box is where? Well, right there. Right there, inside. No eye twitching, Ashley, it's easy. We're just saying where it's at. <laughs> We're just saying where it's at, for heaven's sake. Oh, that's all. This, this, this is the, we're on the brink of pointers, Ugh. which Nelson laughed when I said that I wanted to, to introduce scan F um, on, on the first night, just as kind of a, a little extra, but, but come on guys, it's not bad. Instead of saying what's in age, this guy right here is letting me say where age really is on the computer. Okay. Cool stuff. And Nelson's, Nelson, for those of you that are a little more advanced, he's saying some very good stuff over in BuzzNet, but I'm not going to get into that 
um, in, out, out loud in this uh, class here. We will be getting to all of that stuff um, in this class, just not tonight's class, just in this course, I mean. So the bottom line is we've now seen that in functions we have what kind of variables? Local. Local variables because it's in. And how do we draw them? Here's the function. Here's all our little local variables. And we have another function. And this function has no flipping clue about those guys. <laughs> but we do know that we can tell the other, this other function over here when we call on it, we know we can tell it where, where in memory that guy is. So the only thing I'm wanting you guys to realize at the moment, just to keep this simple, is I'm just going to use this little ampersand symbol right here to get my address of where age really is. That's all. Okay. If we just keep it that simple, that's all. So that doodad tells where the age is. Yay. Jonathan, I am so impressed you're still with and us. And if this doesn't make sense. And, and if this doesn't make sense, just go with it for now. And makes sense. Yeah, yeah, go with it for now. Um, this, like like Jason said, this gets it into pointers, but we have specific uh, specific class blocked out for discussing this in great, great detail. So take it for granted for now, basically. Well, I hope my description helped, though. I mean, the bottom line is it's, it's a local variable, <laughs> and I'm just telling this other function who can't see that variable where it is. Where it is. That's it. Yep. Okay, so okay. what I want to do now is let's just jump back over here into do, 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 Xcode a million and let's write oh my goodness. a simple yeah, I know I'm going crazy it's late <laughs> let's write the pink fuzzies wearing off yeah it really is I love those I wish I lived in Canada <laughs> all right so I'm going to come in here time. and what's the first thing I need to do what's it called I need to declare oh there you go Jen's slowing down I think she's getting tired or has gone to bed I need to declare a variable. I want an age, right? Right. And it's of what type? Integer. So I'm going to make int age. age. Now I need to... I, oh, very good. Did Jen said it out loud. I need, to say, I need to tell the user what they're about to do. I don't need to just look for input. That wouldn't make sense. Well, mm. Go ahead. Best practice. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah Best yeah, yeah, practice. Yeah. yeah, equals zero. Let's initialize it. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so we've, now we've declared and initialized. Good job. Now I need to tell the user what we're looking for. Print so F. I'm going to do very good. Print F. So I start typing it. I hit tab. And I'm going to simply say, what is your age? Question mark. I'm going to put a space after this. Instead of causing a new line, I'm just going to allow the input to take place right after that space. It'll just look better. All right. Here we go. The big one. Now I'm going to use scan F. And then the first thing that I'm going to do is come in here. And I need to use this format specifier. So inside double quotes. Percent D. I need to tell it percent D because that's, that's what we're going to be looking for. Yay. Oh, is this going to prevent a user from doing stupid things? Like typing in whatever the heck they want? No. <laughs> is this error checked and all that good stuff? No. Um. So right now, we have to play really well with our program. So when you build this tonight, please, please or, or whenever you build this, please do not compile it and send it to your grandma and say, give it a try. Because she might have a slip of the number and hit a letter or something because she can't see well, bless her heart, and blow up her. And then her yeah, kitchen. and her kitchen may <laughs> flood. Poor mandrel. I mean, it could blow something up, you know. So let's, let's, let's be careful and cautious here. Okay, so we've now put our format specifier in there. And now the next thing we need to do is we need to tell it the address of where the information needs to be dumped. And that's very simple. Again, we're going to come in here and dereference. I said the D word. Um, age. Oh, you said the D word. So we're going to come in here and dereference age. What, what that means is just by putting this ampersand at the beginning, we're now looking at the address instead of what's in the memory location. Okay. And, and physical hard drive space. In, in, in RAM, right. or however you're, wherever the app's running with uh, virtual memory, if, if need be. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jonathan, my bad. Well, I just looked up and saw that, and it, like, freaked me out that it was coming from you, of all people. I was thinking, he really is tired. <laughs> now, I want to come in here and simply 
say what they entered. So printf, and then we're going to say you entered, or I'm going to say you are however old. You are, and here we're going to use our, what's it called? Quick, quick. What, what is that? Two words, two words. Come on, come on. Oh, God. Format specifier, format very good. Specifier. Okay, so here we are with our format specifier. So now, very good, Mandrel, awesome. <laughs> Same thing. All right, so now you are, whatever number is going to end up being put in there, years old, because you, you better be above zero and, 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 and even one. Um, now we need to, because, well, I'm still inside the double quotes. Uh -huh. Now I need to step outside the double quotes and send my second oh, yes. argument which in this case is going to be age, and then terminate it. Yay! So ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at this most amazing program ever. <laughs> and here we go. Uh, oh yeah, let's come down here and click so that it has focus. In our output window, in our console, I can actually type down here. So what is your age? I'm gonna say... 27. Oh, okay, I like that. <laughs> 27, I'm gonna hit enter. Ladies and gentlemen, Yay! there it is. You see that it actually took <coughs> data in, and we now have that data being printed back out to our console. Okay. Yay! Yay. All right, so, and Brian is freaking out, no, and then all caps, Jason put age as A. What? A... Gary person, a monkey, put age as a string, as a capital A, as a... <laughs> what in... Wait, this is C. Uh, huh? huh? Why aren't you using Visual Studio? That's what I want to know. I'm using Notepad, and by Notepad, I literally mean Notepad. <laughs> Okay, so yes, camel casing all the way. Thank you, sir. I see what he's saying. Um, all right, well, come on. All right, so. What's he saying? Sim sim simple stuff. It's not bad. This is all that's required to be able to grab some input. And now I'm not going to drag you guys through the mud at the moment with, uh, or tonight, with having you do something to submit it. There's a few more data types. And uh, I want to hand control over to no, no, we're not, no, we're not ending. No, 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 we're going further, Matthew. I, I want Nelson to spend a minute and talk about. Uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan, but you do rock. You rock, sir, because um, you got to go to work in just like four hours. Uh, I'm going to hand control over to Nelson, and what I want Nelson to do is talk about some of the other data types, just to give my voice a, a break. Actually, just to give my head a rest, because I've developed a, a huge headache from yelling at the mic for hours now. So, uh, so Nelson, let's go ahead and jump over real quick to your screen. Yes, oh, me. That, that's yes. the only Nelson in class tonight. I'm the second Jason. Uh, the one that says me. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of Jasons over there. It's very confusing. Triplet. So let's start out with uh, start with floats. Okay, I do want to point out really quickly what we mean by other data types. I really wanted to get my whiteboard out actually today. Well, then do at least it. once. Okay, so when we have something like um, int x, that declares that results in a memory location being made available to our program where we can put data in. So we're all familiar with this concept at this point, right? What if we want to store different types of data? Now, an int is only going to be whole numbers. So like one, two, three, negative 10. Those are, this is the, the valid range of values that an int can store. But what if we wanted to store something like 5.2? Or what if we wanted to store the character C? What we need is to use different data types. Now, a data type does not change the way that this works. When you declare a variable, you get a horrible line. You get, in memory, a block of contiguous, um, contiguous bytes that allow you to store data in that. So what if I wanted to store 5.2, for example? How could I store that? I can't do int x equals 5.2. In fact, if I did this,
Um, what's the output to this program? Does anybody, can anybody guess the output? Throw some numbers program? over there. Or your thoughts. Wait. Actually, let me do a better one. What's the output to 5.9? Now, what's the output to this program? Oh. Yep, we get 5. Because it doesn't recognize. That's because an int is not capable of storing this bit of data. So it basically just chops it off, it truncates it. So what if we wanted to store 5.9? Well, in this case, we would use a float. So I would do float f, uh, that looks like a t. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna do another x. How about x2? There we go, that was a good game. Um, float x2 equals 5.2. Now in memory, this is still actually just a block of bytes. In fact, it's the exact same amount of bytes that an int would store. Uh, it, in the case of the current compiler and operating system we're using, this is just four bytes. And this is just four bytes. But what's important is the data inside of this block is actually different. It's formatted different in a way that, that can represent different types of data. So in the case of a float, instead of just a straight up number being stored like it is with an int, a binary number, in the case with a float, you get a floating point number. What does floating point mean? Well, a floating point means is that there's a point and the point floats. So, for example, we can store 5.2, but we could also store 52523.47. And you notice how this little point floated over to the left a little bit. Now we could also store 52523.47. Now notice how the point floated over a little bit more. That's a floating point number. It has an integer component, which is just a number. So this is the integer component. And then it also has a a location of where the point should be located within that integer component. So it's a very precise number and it allows you to store decimals. But here's the interesting thing. When you're working with different data types, especially in a language like C, C does not have what you would call type safety. That means that, for example, if I said float x2 equals 10 and then I did print f um, percent d uh, x2. Uh, let's say instead of 10, I did 50.10, um, 50.10, or 50.15. That's not a five. Um, I don't have shortcuts down very well in Mac and Photoshop. Okay, so what's the output to this program? Float x2 equals 50.15, printf percent dx2. 50.15? Well, let's go ahead and jump into Xcode and see what happens. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull up Xcode. And I'm going to write this program out. And let's see what we come up with. So first I'm going to go ahead and declare and initialize a float. I'm going to do x2 and I did 50.15. See how that's valid now. Now if I did a printf and did percent %d x2 and then I ran this program, look at the output. Now can anybody tell me why I'm getting this output? That is not 50.15. Can anybody tell me? Yes, it's expecting an int. Oh. So remember, the difference between an int and a float or any other data type is they represent data differently. So store data different. That's the difference between the different types in C. However, C is not a very type safe language, meaning although Xcode is telling me, hey, you're being dumb, your format specifies a type of int, but the argument here is type of double. Um, 
although Xcode is telling me I'm being stupid, C is just going to go derp to derp. I'm going to go ahead and pretend that this is an int. I love it. So, so that's the difference between types. So with C, because it's not a very type safe language, you have to be very cognizant about what the type of variables you are using, especially how it relates to the printf family of functions. So, how is everybody feeling about about floats right now and how it relates the to stealth ints? coder says I love when C goes derp to derp. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh my goodness! But people who are new to programming, are you are you slowly starting to maybe understand the different the, the, the fact that there are different data types? and what those different data types mean. It doesn't mean that memory is allocated differently. Memory is you know, memory you can, is memory. Another, another it, keyword that is built into the small collection of reserved keywords for C is size of. Um, you'll have to typecast it, but if you want to do a quick um, size of, you can, you can show what the size of an int is and the size of a float is. Hold on, I have um... See, my, my uh, tablet supports touch, but when I rested my arm on it, it decided to go crazy. Uh, da, da, da. No, I was, I was thinking of um, type, type the, I was oh, going to say, you mean, do print um, F, in quotes, size of int equals, then percent D space byte. And then comma, um, and then what you'll need to do is, okay, yeah, and then just typecast to an int, do size of int. I, they need, oh, dude, they need is, to be, they need to be typecast to an int. And don't worry about this, guys. This is, we'll, we'll be talking about. You did not hear the word yeah, typecast. Yeah, we'll be talking about casting a little bit later. There you go. That illustrates. Yep. So basically, size of is something that you guys will be using in the future a lot. Size of, look at the color. It's another reserved keyword that's built into the C language. And what we're doing is we're telling it to give us the size of in bytes of what an int is. And so Nelson's just kind of formatting it now to make it look a little prettier. So... Yeah, so you see that in memory, these two types of variables contain the exact same amount of bytes, but they're treated differently based off their type. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Now, floats um, allow you to do arithmetic just like integers. So you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, all that fun stuff. I'm not going to go into mixing types. Mixing types becomes very complicated. Like, for example, what happens if you multiply a float by an int? Um, then we have to start getting into typecasting, and that just is a mess. What's important for you guys to realize is what a type actually is. And a type is two things. A type is... Ha type equals the storage requirement... I'm missing a few letters, but I don't care. And the semantics. Now, storage requirement is how many bytes does this contain? So, example, for example, an int equals four bytes on this operating system. And it's semantics. And what's the semantics? Uh, an int just contains an integral type. An inter integral, I, that's a T. On an I. Integral data. Now, what about a float? Float is four bytes. And what's it? What are the semantics of a float? A floating point. F O F F L O A T I N G. It's because he's not typing. That's what happens. And there's a specification as to what floating point data means, but it means the data is formatted differently. That's why you can't tell printf to print out a float as if it were an int, because the data is fundamentally stored in a different format.
Okay, so how is everybody feeling so far? Is everybody good with instant floats? And you don't have to be a specialist on this right now. Just keep in mind, all, all Nelson's getting at is that the, the storage, how much memory are we using? Using four bytes for an int, four bytes for a float. But look at how the data is being stored between these two different types. It's being stored differently. Now let's look at one more type or another type. We'll talk about a few more. What's a double? Well, a double is eight bytes, not surprising, and it stores floating point. And data. I just wanted to point out that Jonathan nailed it with uh, what he said over in BuzzNet, and that is higher precision value. Absolutely. Right. So remember. Remember how a floating point number is just an integral number, like um, one, two, three, four, that's an integral number that can be represented in an integer. But a float is, in addition to the integral aspect, it also has where the decimal point is. So let's say the decimal point is right here. Now a double has twice as much storage to contain the integral value and the decimal. So it can store, let's say a float can only store, um, let's say, I can't remember the actual value. Pretend the float can only store four significant digits. So 12.45 is, is the most significant digits that a float can support. That's not actually true, but just for sake of an example, bear with me. A double will be able to contain 12.4567, for example, eight, three. So it just allows you to store higher precision And why would values. this be important, Nelson? Well, think about um, talk about banks and transactions. Uh, think about banks. Yeah, um, banks often deal with very high pre precision values, um, including um, banks often deal with uh, um, percentages of a uh, of a penny, even all the way to hundreds of billions of dollars that could have many significant office digits. space, baby. Okay, continue. So. You really want to um, to make sure that when you're dealing with something that needs to be correct, like money, you use a very high precision data format. Double. So that's that's an int, a float, and a double. Is everybody good with ints, floats, and doubles? And again, creating these variables all the same, type and identifier. So if you wanted to make a float, you could say float space x terminator, and that declares that declares a variable of type float. Okay, there's one more type that we want to talk about today. At least there's only... Yeah, you right? want to go ahead and talk about char. Okay. A char equals one byte. Now, the semantics of a char are interesting. It's still an integral data. But it's ASCII encoded. Now, what does ASCII encode mean? Well, remember, so a, a character, it's the char is short for, short for character, and it contains one byte, and that byte is really just, in, it, it's really just an integral data with uh, the values between zero and um, 255 are the values that a char can hold. Um, but it's ASCII encoded, and that's the important thing. Um, ASCII encoded means that these numbers are special. They don't, it's not a number that you're representing, it's a character from a map. Now, ASCII is a map. ASCII means that this number equals this character. So, for example, 50 equals A, I believe. I think someone back me up. You know what? We have the technology. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just Google this after I re-log into BuzzNet because I managed to fail right there. Oh, Nelly. Uh, it's yeah, it is. Uh -huh, da, da, da. <clears throat> so here is your run-of-the-mill 
ASCII character map. Oh. This maps all these numbers from actually sorry, uh the chars aren't signed. Uh this isn't zero to two five five. This is negative one hundred and twenty eight to one hundred and twenty eight. Sorry about that. Or one hundred twenty seven. Darn it. Sorry about that. I fail. Okay, so in this case, what we see here is a map of the ASCII encoding. So, for example, um, 97 is lowercase a, whereas, um, I, did I get 50 right? No, 50 is 2. 65 is your capital <laughs> no. Yeah, 65 is capital A. Now, can anybody tell me what the difference is between 48 being 0 and 0 being null? I mean, what I'm trying to get at is 48 is the character 0. And zero is actually nothing. Yes. No. Yeah. Zero. So, does that sort of make sense? When you want to print out the character zero, the integer value is forty-eight. That means that num num equals char. So let me fix this. I'm going to say forty-eight equals zero, and I'm going to put zero in single quotes. 49 equals 1. Um, let's pull up another one. 70 equals P. Uh, lowercase p, sorry. At least, yeah. Okay, so this is what I mean by ASCII encoded. All this means is, yes, a character is a single byte integer, but it has it carries along with it some special semantics that are encoded into the language itself, meaning that the language is going to treat character values differently than other values because it carries that additional semantic value with it. Does that sort of make sense to everyone? I take that as probably a no. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about, um, like, let's go use a Good character. idea. Um, Jason, before I look like an idiot, what's the format specifier? Uh, for percent C. <laughs> All right. And before anybody says anything, I guess I'm doing this intentionally. Okay, so what's the what's the output to this program? I know this is going to be a little bit confusing, but um, no, it's not broken. It's perfectly valid. Keep in mind that we're the types don't really mean much. They mean a lot to you as a programmer, but to the actual printf function, it doesn't really care. It'll take whatever you give it. So let's go ahead and run this. <laughs> You're giving Jonathan a good time. <laughs> okay, so um, what we have here is 48 comma 2. Now this A character is set to the ASCII value zero. Notice how the ASCII value zero, the literal ASCII value zero is enclosed in single quotes. That's really important. Critical. Right. This is not this. This is the integer zero. This is the ASCII character zero. They're different. Now the A character is the ASCII code zero. When I print a character, but I tell printf that I want to print it as an int, it's going to print out the ASCII code of the character zero, which is 48. Back to the map. So if I look at zero, notice how that's the, character the character zero look at the, is look the at number the top, 48. At, um, at the column, chr, that's, that's our character is zero. And the value of the character zero is 48. Now look at a number. 
a number I have set to 50, but I'm printing it as if it were a character. I'm telling printf, I'm lying to printf. Oh. I'm saying, I'm giving you a character, but then I'm turning around and giving it an integer instead that happens to be 50. Then printf says, okay, you're giving me a character, so I'll treat it like an ASCII encoded value. So what's the ask, what happens when I take the number 50 and turn it into an ASCII value? Well, let's look at the map. It's two. 50 turns into the Ta-da. character two. That's why we get a two right here. So let's say I switched it. Now let's say I did a percent C, comma, percent D. <clears throat> now what's the output to this program? So if I go ahead and run this, now we'll get what we expected. We'll get 0, comma, 50. Because a character is being treated like a character, which is set to a character value, zero, the ASCII value 0. And then a number is being treated like an integer, which it should be, and I set it to the value 50. So it gets printed out properly. Wait. Now somebody asked if I treated something with the wrong type. So let's let's go ahead and make, make this go away. Um, and then let's say I said print f uh, d a character. So I'm pr I'm treating a character as if it were an integer on this line on line eight. This does not change the type of a character. Types never change in C. So a character is still a character. And if you're having a hard time grasping this, don't stress. Um, change zero as your character over to like the letter M. So again, since it's inside of the single quotes, it's a character. And the ASCII value of that character, if we were to print that out, we can look up on that chart. Yep. And he made it tricky by putting a zero in there to begin with. One oh nine. Because then you just saw a number. It, it was a very good example for getting your gears rotating. I like it. But, um, but now putting M in there might make it a little easier to see because now you're going to think character a whole lot faster than seeing a zero, which could have some of you guys thinking number. Yep. So let's say I print this, and then I do a new line, and then I print it out as a C. So do a char, a, HR and then HR, and then run this. Now you'll see 109 and then new line M. They're the same value, the exact same value. They just have different yeah, look, semantics. Yeah, before he changes. This is treated as... I was going to say, before he changes, just study line 8 very carefully. The two things that he's printing out is HR and HR, the same thing. But using two different format specifiers, one saying print it out as a whole number, number and the other one saying show it as a character, oh. we can now see, well, if we show it as a number, we're going to get the ASCII number for that character M. And then if we say print it out as a character, ta-da, we see the actual oh. character, M. And now go ahead and prove 109 is a little M over on that sexy map you found. Yeah. If I look at this chart, I go over to 109. And if I go over to the right-hand side, you but, uh, see M's right there, lowercase M specifically. So remember, a, vari <laughs> <laughs> a variable is two things. It is how much space it it's requires to be stored, and it is the semantics behind the type. So an int, four bytes, contains integral data. A float, four bytes, contains floating point data. These two types, let me grab my tablet over real fast again. These two types are not compatible. Um, there we go. These two types, wrong way. <laughs> these two types are not compatible. They're not compatible because they store data in completely different ways. So if you try to read in a float as an int or try to read an int as a float, you will get garbage. These two types, however, are compatible. They store the same data. In, well, they store the exact same type of data, just okay. in a different amount of bytes. So they are compatible. Now, the character stores an in integral data. So it technically is compatible with an int because it's just storing a number. But the important bit is that it's expected to be ASCII encoded, which makes it get treated differently by other functions. Uh, 
All right, so how's everyone feeling about the four different types? We have int, float, double, and character. Comprehend now. Sweet. And this is going to bring us to the end of class. And we'll talk about homework real quick. I'm looking over at the recording, because remember, I only, um, I've only had it recording tonight during lecture. And, uh, and some student reviews, and I, have, I marked the class as four hours, and I've got four hours and three minutes of actual recording. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry that it was five hours and ten minutes. Um, but, hey, we, the bottom line is you guys can come and go as you need, and you can watch the video at any given time. I did say at the very beginning that this class is going to require dedication, determination, and lots and lots of patience. We will help in any way that we have to, to help you guys understand. Tonight's the easiest night of the four weeks. Tonight's the walk in the park. Uh -oh. It will become more difficult next week when we get into decision making, looping, writing functions. Pointing. Though a lot of this stuff, like functions, we've already talked a lot about functions. You guys have heard parameter lists, arguments, function names, return types. Functions are inside, um, when they're being defined, they're inside curly braces. You've heard function invocations, invoking a function or calling a function. You've already had a lot of seeds planted tonight that should come back around and be very helpful next Tuesday night. Now, I do... Uh, appreciate very much those of you that are programmers that have been very tolerable of me tonight and Nelson as well especially me though because I, I know that I, I break things down as far as I can and try to, to spoon feed as carefully as I can but those of you that are beginners I'm, I'm really wanting you guys to stick with this I'm wanting you guys to make it through this class and feel good about it and then us get into the iPhone development class and I want to start seeing 3d bus students creating cool iPhone apps but you're gonna have to have that understanding of objective C before we can jump in there and do it because we're going to be using that um, uh, so I mean we have to there you have it so exactly now the homework for tonight is, and again, this is going to be the easiest of the homework. You now know how to get information from a user. But technically, you don't yet know how to make decisions or loop with that information. So you can't say, how old are you? And then if they entered an age less than 21, come back and say, ha ha, too bad, you can't drink. <laughs> so, oh, keep, stop reminding so, me. You're about to be 21 awesome. soon. So... You're going to learn how to do that next week. But you do know how to take information from a user. You do know how through expressions to manipulate that information. And you do know how to regurgitate the information to, to basically spit it back out to the console. So what I am looking for is a program that you guys write that's going to contain two elements inside the function main. The first one is real simple. You're just going to tell the user that we're about to calculate the area of a rectangle and then ask them for a width, ask them for a height, and then say what it was, what the area was. And surely you guys all know how to calculate the area of a rectangle. You just multiply the two things together. And then for the second algorithm that I want you to have in there, I want you to surprise me. Pick something. Ooh, there is one more thing in case anybody starts doing anything with circles. Nelson, take just one second to talk about constants. It, it was uh, okay. it well, was in the constant. syllabus. This is a, a very, very simple thing to understand. This is not complicated. And you can use pi as, um, yep, thank you very much. It's just like a regular variable, needs an identifier, 
needs a type. Naming convention, notice how it's all capitalized. It makes it easy to identify, that's a convention, that it's a constant. Now it has the keyword, again, you notice that const is in purple, indicating it's a reserve keyword. Const means that the number that we're now storing in pi cannot change. It is constant. You cannot do what he's doing right now. See the big error? It says read only variable, not assignable. So I just wanted to, to make sure you guys understood what const was. So const can go in front of any of your types. So if you have a char or if you have an int or if you have a double and you want it to have a value that can never be changed, make sure you put const in front of it. And it, it basically makes that variable read only. You also have to initialize it on the line as well. Yeah. <laughs> nice. This is stupid. Oh, I do want to talk, a, talk about errors actually real fast, or maybe we should leave that till the beginning of next week because I think we've lost. Not people. many, like two. Go, go ahead and give a... a... No, I, I, think, I think people are... Uh, uh, people's heads are sort of... Uh... Well, what, did you, what did you want to... My head's All right, fine. I, I I just wanted to go through the three types of errors, but um, we, we okay. can do that on okay. next week. Yeah, because the, the homework, this is the easiest homework of the whole darn course. So um, all you guys need to do is you, you need to go ahead and, and have a, an interactive console tool application that is going to ask the user, it's going to let the user know that we're about to calculate the area of a rectangle, it's going to ask for width, it's going to ask for height, and then it is going to give us the result. Another thing, and this one I will leave for you guys to look up yourselves, format specifiers. You know how we can use percent %f to show the, um, a, a, a floating point number? number with a decimal in it. I want to I want to point this out by default the precision that it shows is 6. So if you were to print f out the um, pi right there, we would end up with 3.14000. Well, okay, my bad. <laughs> it's already down there. That's what I get for not paying. You get 6 characters. Format specifiers. You can easily control how many digits, what the precision of what is printed out is. This is your first time you get to use Google or the help file to find out how. Remember, these are format specifiers. It's very, very easy. But you will find as a programmer, once the course is over and you're programming stuff, you're going to find yourself hitting books, hitting Google, hitting the help file all the time, becoming Becoming yeah, resourceful is, is important as a, as a programmer. Yeah, um, don't think that um, to become a programmer, you have to memorize absolutely every single API, every single function, every single parameter list. Being a good programmer is not filling your head with stuff that's easily referenceable. Um, so learning how to Google and find information quickly and scan through documentation quickly is a very important skill and will make you able to be a lot more effective at programming and a lot more effective at learning different aspects of programming. Jen just asked the uh, this is the first time I've ever seen this. Uh, hey, Nelson, um, will we have an option for saving out chat sessions in the future from BuzzNet? Oh. Um, if you wanted to hit Control-S within your browser, you can save it out. But, but right it now, but it is all logged. I mean, we could come up with something in the future. All of this stuff is is kept. Yeah, and it's all you know by by specific class by session, so it's all good stuff. It's all there in the database. Is what I'm getting at. It loses some of the history. Jen says it loses some of the history. Pew. Pony. <laughs> okay, so. Guys, uh, 
Sorry, I'm just. All right. Well, I, I just wanted to. Uh, we'll we'll get the. If it's not up tonight, it'll be up uh, early tomorrow. Well, tomorrow, <laughs> and that that is the um, the homework. But the video, uh, I'll stay up and get that encoded now. Uh, submissions are going to be just like everything we're doing Nina. at the moment. Yeah, Nina at 3dbuzz.com, and that will be in the um, um, homework. Homework, and all we're going to ask you to do is send just your .c file. So your main .c file is all you're going to be sending. No, no full projects and everything Alrighty. else. It's going to be very simple. So that is going to wrap tonight's class up. Man, you guys, you guys are rocking. You guys seriously are really awesome. I am highly, highly impressed with this class. I cannot believe that almost all of you stayed to the very end. That's that's so impressive. Thank you, guys. Oh, Jen asked and, the mid how. Oh, yeah, that's what I was just oh. saying. Just oh, email sorry, it to, to you. No, it's all good. Um, but thank you guys very much. And go get some sleep. Or for those of you that have to now go to work, I'm so sorry. Jonathan, have a good day at work. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again as soon as we get a um, an open office hours. It's not as critical this week. It'll start becoming critical with the lectures from next week when we get into logic. But um, I, I will make sure to make posts about that over in the um, uh, member sponsor lounge. So keep an eye over there in case something comes up. And again, don't forget, live classes is where you can go to gain access quickly to this video and homework once it's there. So again, you guys all rock. Thank you. And that's Yay, it for tonight. Good night. Goodbye, everyone. Ready. See you guys.